Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, February 6, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for February 6, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when uh, speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh. I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty Well, good evening, everybody. Before I kick it over to Adrian and get rolling here, I want to say a couple of things real quick. Thank you and welcome. Um, first of all, apologies for this on my face. Uh, I had some close contact with someone who has COVID, so in respect to my colleagues and within the health guidelines, I decided to do this. I promise that I will smile at you with my eyes as much as possible throughout the meeting, so just be ready for that. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to say just real quick, you know, I, I looked at the agenda tonight. Um, we've got a packed agenda this evening, and I think um, those of us that are on the end of it, I appreciate you being here. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to do our best to, to get to you as soon as we can, but, you know, in doing so, we're, we're kind of on the cusp of having quite a few long meetings here, so I just wanted to kind of reiterate a, a couple of things. As we, as we have the discussion we have, I encourage us to have the fullest discussion possible, but do it in a way that is um, as concise and to the point as we can, just so we can keep make, making sure that we're moving things through. Um, in no way am I suggesting that we limit discussion. In fact, what I'm actually trying to say is if the more efficient we can be with that, the better it'll be. And I think we can have a fuller discussion that way. And that goes for us up here, but then also everybody out there as well. Um, during public input, we normally have five minutes uh, for each individual to speak. I'm gonna try and stick to that tonight as much as we can because we do have quite a bit to cover. Uh, and I wanna make sure that we get to everybody that we possibly can. If you're here to speak tonight, you will get your opportunity to do so. I just wanna make sure you know that. I'm gonna make sure that we, we get through everybody. So with that said, I will go back to Adrian for our first item. Thank you. Our first item is presentations. We have the COVID-19 update. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. This is Mary Rose Corrigan, Public Health Director with the Health Services Department. I too am playing it safe tonight and coming to you remotely for your February 2023 COVID update. And I'll Randy is going to advance the slides for me, so I'll see that they're up there. Okay, great. Um, so as we look at the overall epi curve, um, we can see that the, the curve is definitely staying down in the past few weeks. Um, and the next slide shows that um, since January 5th, we've had a total of 264 reported cases. And of those, this is how the age breakdown occurs. It's pretty much been an equal opportunity virus infecting people. Um, the zero to 10 year olds continue to have the most infections, but not by a lot. So um, it's affecting all of our age groups. And in the past um, seven days, as of last Wednesday, 
we had 81 cases, which is quite a jump from what we've had in the most recent weeks. But when I looked at the numbers today, we were back down to 48 cases for the last seven um, days. I do want to tell you that the uh, variant of the um, Omicron, the sublineage XBB 1.5 is here. And this sublineage is about 52% of sequenced um, tests nationwide as of January 21st. So the vaccine effectiveness against this sublineage is um, still being researched and we'll talk about that in a minute. Our community um, level is at low and there's there's been a big shift in our hospital inpatient beds, which is great news. Um, and you can see that most of Iowa is now low and a good part of the country. Our vaccinations um, continue to slowly creep up. Um, the next slide shows our map that we've, um, with the percent of fully vaccinated greater than five years that have also had a bivalent booster, we're up to 21% now. Um, it was at 19.8 at the end of December. Um, this seems like a rather dismal number and we'd really like to do it and get it up higher. The U.S. average is 15.5% for this metric. Our hospitalizations continue to be low, and I want you to really pay attention to the, the part I circled on that bottom graph, and that is the percentage of ICU beds, intensive care unit beds in the hospitals occupied by COVID patients, and you can see that number is very low, and that's important because it shows that people are not getting severely ill or as severely ill as they were in the past where you can see those other high spikes on that chart. So this is another sign of vaccine effectiveness and general um, community immunity. <clears throat> um, speaking of vaccines, um, we know that an updated COVID vaccine um, does prevent illness from the XBB related variants. Now it may not prevent you from getting infected, but it all of the boosters have had a, a big increase on hospitalizations and deaths. And the effectiveness on this latest sublineage is still unfolding. They appear to be effective in people who have received two, three or four monovalent vaccine doses. And so once again, all people should stay up to date with the recommended COVID-19 vaccines, including the bivalent booster when you're eligible. In Dubuque County, um, our retail providers continue to have vaccines and the VNA continues with their open walk-in clinics on Mondays and Fridays. They probably will be ending the Monday one after February, but uh, as long as there's a nurse available at the VNA, uh, you can go get a vaccine pretty much any time, and they have um, all the types of vaccines there. Just a quick word on influenza. Uh, we, our Iowa is showing minimal influenza-like illness, and that's a, a big change from just a month ago when we were um, substantial and moderate. To date, we've had 119 deaths in Iowa due to influenza this season. And the chart on the right shows the hospitalizations due to influenza, and they continue to stay low. Um, another sign of good news. Um, just one other thing on the vaccination front, a uh, study came out from the Center for Disease Control. And worldwide, over 80% of the people who have died from COVID-19 are over 60. And um, with that, it's, it's also noted that only 76% of elderly people above 60 have been vaccinated, which is well below the World Health Organization's goal of 100% for that age group. So vaccinating those 60 years and older continues to be a priority and with all the boosters and bivalent vaccines. 
the CDC did another study that was released recently on what are the reasons why people are not receiving a COVID-19 booster? Well, 23% said they lacked awareness of eligibility or availability for vaccination. Um, this is somewhat understandable. It's gotten quite complicated and as different age groups were added and new vaccines, there was a lot of information floating out there. And this was a survey of about 1,200 COVID-19 vaccinated U.S. Um, adults conducted to assess reasons for receiving or not receiving a bivalent booster. So like I said, 68% who had not received the bivalent booster dose indicated they planned to do so. In a follow-up survey, however, one month later, about 29% of those participants reported receiving the dose. So although 68% said they were gonna get it, only about 28, 29% received it. And if, if they hadn't done so, they still indicated they were going to get it. So we just have to continue to stress the importance of the vaccine and make sure it is available. So you've heard about the federal public health and natural, national emergency declarations ending on May 11th. Is this the end of the pandemic? Are we going into a pandemic or what do we call this? Um, well, there's really no number or level of disease that defines a pandemic or emergency. So in addition to looking at the epidemiological data, there's mother, many other factors, um, social, political, cultural, our resources, access to care, and what's our level of tolerance. The public health and health community looks at hospitalizations, death, vaccination, coverage, immunity, and can the transmission be slowed or predicted? And that's kind of the one stickler that we haven't been able to get over is we have not yet been able to um, predict the transmission or the variants coming or the timing of them. So we're not quite at the endemic stage because we still can't predict this or the severity. And this, this may take years. And I think that's why the WHO or the World Health Organization um, they continue to say we're in a public health emergency of international concern, and they acknowledge that we're at a transition point. Now, sometime in probably the next month or two, um, the Iowa Health and Human Services Department will end COVID-19 reporting. Um, there hasn't been a hard, fast date for that yet. Okay. Um, I think I showed you the slide before about what happens when the COVID-19 emergency declarations end, and quite a bit happens. Um, coverage and costs and payment for testing, treatments, and vaccine ends. Um, Medicaid coverage may change, federal match may change, telehealth may change somewhat, although that's really been integrated into a lot of practices now. And some insurance com companies uh, may change, and we may have less access to vaccine tests and treatments. Uh, all providers get their vaccine through Operation Warp Speed and the federal government. So once the federal government uh, quits purchasing that vaccine and it becomes on the open market, then there will be a charge either to the insurance company or the patient for those vaccines. So that's just, um, you know, what happens when the declaration ends. And finally, um, this kind of gives a picture of, you know, how the pandemic is and the WHO is using their influenza risk management guidance kind of as an example of pandemic phases. So we're, as you can see, just by the curve on that graph, we're kind of into the recovery phase now. And um, we'll hopefully continue down the path of recovering and moving into um, preparedness for the next season. And uh, finally, um, just a word on uh, next month, I'll be giving you a presentation in mid-March and 
uh, I'd also like to kind of for you to think about if you want me to continue um, past April to give you these COVID updates, either in March or April, we should have the results of our after action report and improvement plan for the pandemic. So I would like to present that to you, but um, uh, you might just wanna think about if you want me to keep doing these uh, presentations monthly. So that's all I have for you today. And um, be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Mary Rose. Questions, discussion? We have a charge for the next time to think about whether we wanna keep receiving these reports. So we'll, I see heads nodding, Mary Rose. We'll keep that in mind. Thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. And we look forward to seeing you again at the next report. Thank you. All right, Adrian. We will move on to proclamations. Our proclamation this evening is Kiwanis Club of Dubuque 103rd Anniversary Week. All right. And we're having a walkout. No, I'm just kidding. These guys, we have some Kiwanis members here. So we are, everybody's going to join together. And uh, I have the name Nora McCarville here accepting. Yes, Nora, welcome this evening. I'll let you all gather at the podium there and you can uh, say a few words before I read the proclamation. It's a whole sheet, but it's still a few words. That's fine. <laughs> Pardon my voice. It comes and goes as it pleases. So thank you, Mayor Cavanaugh, and thank you also to Council Members Laura Roussel and Rick Jones for submitting the proclamation request and for City Council for its approval. A hundred plus year history is hard to tell in a few minutes, but I believe the dedication of the Duke Kiwanis members shows why the organization is celebrating 103 years next week. It's because of members like Larry Friedman, a 59-year member. He is affectionately known by the club as Mr. Peanut. He supported many projects and many, he has had many roles of service over his years in Kiwanis. But each year, since the mid-1970s, he has worked diligently to support our peanut sales which takes place in the fall of each year. He is our, it is our biggest money maker, he is our biggest cheerleader, and um, he is now has the position of honorary chairman of the peanut sales within the Kiwanis. Or it's a member like Ed Blinks, who will be a 50-year member next month. He also has had many roles, president more than once, and helped on many projects and done many years of service. He now does the induction of our new members, the entire three minutes, verbatim, from memory. Our members and our members who have been with Kiwanis for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, each has kept Kiwanis an active and a effective organization in Dubuque. <clears throat> in years prior to 2021, grants were given to community organization who had requested help with projects that benefited children. In the beginning of 2021, we started our community partnerships. In 2022 and 2023, we partnered with St. Mark's Youth Enrichment and Opening Doors and not only did we give them a total of $12,000 each in monetary support, but our helping hands for their projects within their organizations. We also support Salvation Army by doing bell ringing in December, and we help Dubuque Main Street uh, with the music on Main each year. One of the unique things that we have is the Ella Iowa District of Kiwanis, which runs along the Mississippi River, and it has all the Kiwanis organizations that belong to that district. Within this district, they run a foundation called the um, Kiwanis Neuro Research Foundation. This foundation is specific to this district. It's not part of any other district or the national organization. This um, supports um, the foundation does support to top level research in diseases of the central nervous system. We will hold the KNRF Dubuque Kiwanis Family Breakfast on April 22nd at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. 
50% of everything that we get that day goes to KRNF. The other stays with us to help us provide support for our children here in Dubuque. Also, on Saturday, June 10th, from 10 to 1, we will be having the first Kiwanis Kids Day at Miracle League Park. It is a free event for all children in Dubuque, ages 5 to 12. There will be activities, games, a bounce house, and of course, prizes. So we invite you all to attend as council members. You don't have to be 5 to 12 to come and see what's happening. But you know, you might be able to ask to be sit on the dunk tank. <laughs> we have members from all walks of life, working and retired. And so we meet the second through the fourth or fifth Mondays at noon at the Eagles and Century Drive. And the first Monday of month, we have a satellite meeting at the High V on Dodd Street and the Market Grill. Again, you know, this is a social thing and we socialize, so come on down. And so to continue our 103rd legacy, we need everyone because hashtag kids need Kiwanis. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Nora, and thank you for, for saying all that and providing us with a little background of the 103 years that you've spent here in Dubuque, and for everyone who's here tonight to be able to accept this proclamation. Uh, I know I speak for the rest of the council when I say we'd be happy to come to your event if you allow us in the bounce house. So uh, that'll be fun. Thank you. City of Dubuque proclamation. Whereas Kiwanis International is one of the largest service organizations in the world with more than 551,000 members of all ages and abilities in more than 80 nations. And whereas the members of Kiwanis Club of Dubuque are devoted to improving the world one child and one community at a time. And whereas hashtag kids need Kiwanis speaks for itself. And whereas in addition to improving the lives of children in Dubuque and in communities around the world, Kiwanis Club members promote the development of community leaders, positive role models, intercultural understanding and cooperation, and opportunities for fellowship, personal growth, professional development, and community service and will continue to have a positive impact on our community and residents. And whereas the Kiwanis Club of Dubuque annually raises thousands of dollars and distributes those funds to worthwhile organizations in the community. And whereas the service provided by the Kiwanis Club of Dubuque also involves members of the Kiwanis family, including elementary school K-Kids, middle school builders club, high school key clubs, and Actian Club for adults with disabilities. And whereas the first Kiwanis Club started in Detroit, Michigan, USA in 1915, and the Kiwanis Club of Dubuque was formed on February 14, 1920, and they invite all past members of the Kiwanis family and the public to help them celebrate their 103rd anniversary with a week of celebration and a special Kiwanis Kids Day this summer. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of February 12th through the 18th, 2023, as Kiwanis Club of Dubuque 103rd Anniversary Week in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Come on. We'll skip the handshake today, but I'll hand it properly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. All right. Adrian, we can move along. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Is there anyone in chambers who would like any of the consent items held for separate discussion this evening? No one. Do we have anyone virtually? You do not. Okay. And no input received. All right. Back to the table then. Uh, Ms. Wethoff. I would like to pull consent item number 11 from the consent agenda as my father serves as the president and CEO of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. And this item deals with funding for GDDC from the city of Dubuque. Thank you. Any others? 
Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Stone. I would like to hold item number five. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I moved, I moved to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number five and number 11. Second by Farber. Okay, you got a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. All right. Number 11, Ms. Wethel, you mentioned the reason for holding it. Have anything else to discuss? I'll move the floor. No? Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move that we uh, adopt number 11 as recommended. Second by Sprank. We have, did you want to throw receive and file into that motion, Mr. Sure, Jones? receive and file and, and approve. Okay, thank you. So we've got a motion by Jones, a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passed. It's a 6 0. And number five, Ms. Roussel. Yes, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank council or to congratulate Council Member Farber on her appointment to the National League of Cities Information Technology and Com Communications Committee. Um, I know that is her area of expertise, and it is so wonderful to have that represent representation from Dubuque at the National League of Cities. Uh, we are fortunate to have her voice on that committee. So that being said, I would like to receive and file. Okay, we've got a motion by Roussel and a second by Resnick. And I'll just add uh, congratulations, Ms. Farber. Thank you very much for your Thank service you. in this. I look forward yeah. to it, and, and I think it's a very unique opportunity for the city of Dubuque to have our voice. And uh, there's, not, uh, there's just uh, not even two dozen of us on that committee. Uh, and there are experts uh, far and wide and commonalities of the municipalities uh, in terms of IT infrastructure, broadband needs, cybersecurity. So I really look forward to um, assisting uh, Terry and all the good work that she does for us uh, as we move forward, uh, hopefully soon, with some new opportunities here in Dubuque. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, motion to second. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to items set for public hearing. Our first is set public hearing for resolution establishing maximum property tax dollars for fiscal year 2024. And since state law requires the city council to establish the maximum amount of property tax dollars prior to the public hearing, city council will take action on this item separately for the, uh, from the other set for public hearing items. And I will also note that there are two separate motions recommended for this item. Thank you, Adrian. I'll entertain a motion, please. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to um, receive and file, and is there a presentation to view, or? Um... There, there will be, yes. Okay. And then uh, do the motion do also the... includes setting the property tax rate. Would you like to add that as well? Yes. Yes, I would to uh, set the property tax rate as well. Second by Wethel. Okay. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. Um, Karina, I'm just going to look to you to make sure we did that right. This is confusing every year, so I'm just making that, sure. That's fine. You can go ahead and handle this one first, and then there's the second recommended action. You can do that second. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Mike, I'll come to you. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Larson is recommending that a February 20th, 2023 Public hearing be set for the establishment of the fiscal year 2024 maximum property tax dollars. At the February 20th, 2023 public hearing, sorry, my mic wasn't on. Thank Apologize. you. Apologize. At the February 20th, 2023 public hearing, the only options available to City Council are to approve the amount of maximum property tax dollars as is or decrease it. A simple majority vote will be required to approve the maximum property tax dollars resolution. In fiscal year 2023, so the current fiscal year, the city levied for $26,205,437 in property tax revenue to support the general fund. And in fiscal year 2024, the budget guidelines would levy for $26,623,475 in property tax revenue to support the general fund. 
The fiscal year 2024 budget guidelines call for a 1.96% increase in the property tax rate, which increases the property tax rate from $9.7169 in fiscal year 23 to $9.9075 in fiscal year 24, which would be a 3% or $23.75 tax increase for the average Dubuque homeowner. The increase in property tax for commercial would be 8.84% or $270.61 for the average commercial. And an increase for industrial would be 6.62% or $299.27 for the average industrial property. So to look at the chart, the property tax rate percent change would be 1.96%, and that's that $0.19 dollar change. The property tax asking would be a 1.6% increase or $418,038. The average residential payment would be a 3% increase or $23.75. The average commercial payment would be 8.84% or $270.61. And the average industrial property would be 6.62% or $299.27. Since 1989, and that's when the local option sales tax was passed here in our community, the average homeowner has averaged an annual increase in cost in the city portion of their property taxes of 1.31%, or about $7.98 a year. If the state had been fully funding the homestead tax credit, the increase to the average homeowner would have been $5.16 a year. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully recommend mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Do you have any further presentation or is that? Okay, no, sir. Um, Krenna, before I open to discussion, I just want to make sure, you know, we usually when we set items for public hearing, we don't have discussion until a public hearing. Um, if I open the floor for discussion here for us at the council table, are there any parameters we need to think about for discussion? So really at this point, all you're doing is um, receiving, filing, and then setting the rate. Um, the discussion really should happen at the public hearing on the matter. So mm -hmm. really, um, we should vote on this item. Mm -hmm. And then the second, which would be the receive and file, adopt the resolution, set the public hearing for February 20th would mm -hmm. follow that. Mm -hmm. And then all of the discussion would then occur February 20th. Got it. Uh, real quick on that, though. This is where we set the maximum rate. So discussion about the maximum rate should and can occur right here. Yes. Okay. Yes. But then for the... <clears throat> the actual, like the public hearing on it, though, that discussion will occur on the 20th. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, and I'd like to just, no, never mind. I'm not going to say that out loud. So it's just so complicated. It doesn't need to be, but yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So you're going to, so you're going to discuss the motion on the floor. Yep. And then once that is done and you have voted, you will move on to two. Understood. We good? Okay. All right. So motion on the floor. To receive and file, um, hear the presentation, and set the maximum property tax rate. So I'll open the discussion for that here at the table, please. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Jones. For, for the comfort of those watching, I just it looks like we're new at this. It's because we kind of are. This was a fairly recent law change that requires us to do this. The last thing first, frankly, in, in how a budget ought to be put together. So that's why we weren't quite sure how to proceed. We're better at that at most of the other stuff we're going to do. Well, and and... For full disclosure, that was the nature of my maybe flippant comment here, and that I, I think this has been complicated by the Iowa legislature unnecessarily. And, and I don't mind saying that out loud every single year, um, but since 2019 is when we've been doing this. So um, here we are, and we're doing it by the law, by the code. Ms. Farber. Yeah, so I just have a, a math question here. So it looks like the differential between last year and this proposal is about $400,000. Uh, is that ample? in terms of um, some of the priorities of the city going forward and the personnel issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Can you kind of just give us a little bit sure. of a um, summary of, of the differential here and what it means? Sure, so the mayor and council had established uh, the retention and recruitment in, of employees as one of your priorities. And so um, this tax asking levy allows us uh, 
allows me to recommend in through the budget process, which I will be doing, um, a uh, wage increase for employees. Now we have five unions and we have five existing uh, collective bargaining agreements that call for next fiscal year, which is what we're talking about here, that starts July 1st of 2023, for a 3% wage increase. And my recommendation, and, and this provides funding, along with other resources, of course, is property taxes are not the only resources that go into our budget, um, to provide uh, most employees a 5% pay raise instead of 3%, as had been originally planned through those collective bargaining agreements. Um, except in the case of uh, sworn police officers, sworn firefighters, and then the uh, emergency 911 communication dispatchers who in this recommendation will receive a 6% wage increase instead of 5%. Um, in addition, it allows us to recommend um, to fund uh, most of the non-recurring uh, improvement package request that departments had. And remember how the departments come up with their improvement package requests is they look at the mayor and city council priorities and then they try and identify what resources they need to meet your priorities. Um, it also would allow us to fund about uh, $700,000 of the recurring improvement packages out of a total request of uh, somewhere between 1.7 and $2 million in uh, recurring improvement packages. And while that doesn't sound great, that's pretty much the way it works out every year. I mm -hmm. mean, we commonly receive way more uh, recurring improvement package requests than we reasonably can afford based on the reasonable standard being how much are we, uh, am I willing to recommend to increase the property taxes on our residents and our businesses. And so with this recommendation, we could fund about 700,000 of those. And uh, the capital projects budget is not part of this discussion tonight. Um, that will be part of the budget recommendation, but it does uh, allow us to do um, several uh, or, or many of the capital projects that we'll wanna do. But the reason it's not part of this discussion is that doesn't, relate much to the actual tax asking. Those funding sources are from uh, mostly the enterprise funds like the water fund and the sanitary sewer fund and the stormwater fund and the refuse collection fund. And then also uh, other funding sources like uh, tax increment financing sources to fund capital projects. So I don't know, was that responsive to your question? Yeah, it does. And I did a little bit of math while you were explaining that too. Um, can Jennifer give us a little, um, perhaps a little information if we were to increase this budget, just say by a quarter of a million? I'm curious as to what that percent point would look like, the 9.9075 <laughs> approximately. And is the, I remember last year we actually created a buffer um, just in case, and I think that uh, we had some flexibility there and we, I think, decided uh, to pare that down, but it does give us a cushion. If I remember that because this is as high as we can go uh, for this year, um, and if something were to be further discussed in the budget sessions, that does give us a little bit of flexibility. So do you know, do you have an idea? Sorry to put you on the spot. It's just the first of many times we're gonna ask Jennifer to do public math. Yeah, I'm going to try to avoid that. Uh, Jennifer Larson, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, so a 1% increase in the tax rate generates roughly $267,000. Okay. And this may be a question for Corinna, but due to the complications of the residential rollback and being unsure of where the valuations will end up, I mean, can we decide on a... Uh, dollar value for the levy instead of a rate. I think that is what the Iowa Department of Management sent out to focus on the dollar amount of the levy instead of the rate. I'm looking it up. Give me okay. one second. Right. Thank you, Prina. But you understand the reason for my question. I'm just looking for some kind of a cushion uh, as, a, as a budget backup, not that we have to exercise um, the opportunity to use it, but it would be nice to have an opportunity to use it. 
right. came from the Department of Management. Jenny, I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, it's from Ted Nelson from the Iowa Department of Management. Mr. Mayor, can I ask an unrelated question or do you want to wait till this is done? Um, let's, let's let Krenna think here for a second and then, then, we'll, then we'll jump to well, that. It's, it's not the thinking so much as I actually have to find the guidance that de the Department of Management put out where they specifically answered the question whether it was rate or levy, and I don't recall off the top of my head, so I just need a moment to find it. Would you mind if we move to another no, question? Please Is that go okay? ahead. All right, yeah, Mr. Resnick then. Is that all right, Ms. Farber? You had the floor. Yeah, all right, I appreciate Mr. That. Mr. Resnick, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to uh, ask Mr. Um, Ben Milligan, if he remembers the same thing, that we uh, adopted some kind of a cushion last year, and I and I had thought that we had considered it, and then we decided that your number included, uh, you know, you were very thoughtful in that number, and you had already included uh, perhaps some things that might go awry, and we didn't change the number that you gave us last year. So my recollection is you did change it, um, but I don't know, Jennifer, do you recall? They did increase the number last year, I thought? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Another question is, yeah. it, I, just, I, I don't real know. Quick, as a, as a follow up to that question, though, um, we, we did change that number, but then brought the number down during the budget hearings, is, is what ended up happening. We were able to. Yeah, I don't think you used your maximum number right. that you set. That's a good yeah. clarification, but you did give yourself additional room in case you wanted to use right. it. And, Mr. Mayor, I think we used a little bit of it. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Resnick, go ahead. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right. Checking in on Krenna? Still working. I'm still working. All right. It's slow. Ms. Wethel, did you have your hand? Ms. Roussel, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, just, I just want to remind everyone that at this point, we've not seen the whole budget. We, we have all of these budget hearings coming forward. And so um, I think that is why last year we built in a little extra so that if something comes along through those budget hearings that seems very important, that that would benefit our community, that citizens uh, need, uh, that we have that flexibility. Otherwise, we've really handcuffed ourselves um, to this number. Yeah. Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, this is not a follow-up. It's a different question. Is that okay? Again, for Mr. Van Milligan, though. Uh, Mr. Van Milligan, does this number that you um, gave us tonight, does this, in, could you tell us about the, the problem with the state that uh, there was a 600 some thousand dollar problem? Right. Is that included in this budget or did we uh, anticipate that that situation would be cleared up? So uh, the state made a mistake when they provided all the cities and counties and school district across the state with what they call the rollback factor. It, it lessens the amount of taxable value that a city, county, or school district can tax based on rolling back some of the value. And they made a mistake on the number they gave. And so um, they've gone to the state legislature and asked them to correct the mistake. And if the state legislature corrects the mistake, um, we would collect $627,000 less uh, with this rate, with our, I'm sorry, with a, with a set rate uh, than we had originally thought based on the original rollback. So, uh, Mayor Cavanaugh and I have met uh, and other mayors and city managers and chief financial officers have met with uh, some of the Republican leadership about this issue because, of course, they control the legislature and the governor's office, the Republicans, to find out what the odds were that this is going to pass this corrective legislation, which would lower the rollback factor. And we've been pretty much assured it's gonna pass. So this budget that I'm recommending to you assumes that's gonna happen. Okay, great. That's the answer I was hoping for too, thanks. 
All right. Corinna. So on the question on rate versus dollars, the additional guidance that the Department of Management put out in advance of this legislation being passed was that we should be looking at dollars as opposed to the rate. So it's about the total dollars that would be levied. Okay. So the city council, instead of talking about rate, can just say they would like to levy for this many more dollars and then Jennifer can calculate that for the public hearing. Correct. And then if that needed to be adjusted or reduced, you would have the flexibility to do that. Okay. Ms. Farmer, back to you. Yes, is that, um, is just for credit, do we make a motion on that or do we give guidance for that? How is that resolved? An amendment to the motion, maybe? I'm, I'm just want to look at it here for a minute. So we've got receive and file, set the maximum property tax rate. Um, I'm going to pull up the resolution and look at it to make sure we do this right. So Jenny, there's not, this just talks about the maximum tax dollars for the affected tax levy. So the resolution actually would be okay without amendment, correct? Yeah. Okay, she's nodding. Um, so since the, um, the resolution setting the public hearing, well, hold on, there's gotta be, is there a second resolution setting the rate? There is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Jenny, if I look at the top line of that, it says regular taxable valuation and it has the budget year proposed maximum property tax 23-24. So if we're gonna add dollars, that's where that's gonna go, correct? Into the notice of public hearing? Yeah. Okay, so if you wanna add dollars into that, if you pull up the, um, it's got a chart mm -hmm. at the top. So in there it has the um, 2682829520. For reference, it's the document labeled Fiscal Year 24 Maximum Property Tax Resolution Notice of Public Hearing. Correct. Okay. Now, Jenny, if they amend that top line, does that mess with any of them the rest of the way down the column? <laughs> Sorry. So the actual um, tax ask asking is actually at the bottom. The bottom. Above the calculated tax levy rate. So it currently shows $26,321,601. So that would be the dollar amount you would increase. Um, a disclaimer, this does not include our debt service levy. So it doesn't apply to that. So that's outside of this. Yeah. Thank you. So so before before we move this forward, let me, I, I got a couple of comments. I, Last year was a bit of a different situation um, for a number of reasons. So one of the things that, that I recall, and, and anybody can correct me I'm not, if my recollection is wrong here, but one of the things I recall is that last year, um, city manager came to us asking for a property tax, um, to basically staying the same, but the rate lowering, correct? Yes. The rate was lower than the, than the year previous. Right. This year, we're in a different situation. We're asking for more tax dollars that are built into this chart that we see right here. Mm -hmm and the, with a rate increase. On top of that is home assessments and property assessments going up pretty drastically this year for, for people in our community and all across Iowa. On top of that is, uh, I'm trying to think of words to explain, like the, just, and there are a lot of levers being pulled right now by the state legislature. And I, I don't think anybody really has a sense of what all those, all that lever pulling is gonna end with. So that means we're talking about, not only are we talking about the, uh, this, this correction of the, the Department of Revenue occurring um, right in the middle of our budget time, um, we're also talking about uh, the possibility of property taxation changes, we're talking about sales tax changes, we're talking about all kinds of things um, that are sort of the central discussion right now um, for the legislature. 
my concern here is I, I really think that, um, you know, as far as the rate goes as it is right now, um, I think that the city manager and staff have done a, a, a pretty good job of being able to take a look at this with all of that going on and say, this is what we think we're going to need. Um, I know I've heard a lot about supporting our, our staff and being able to raise um, wages, not as much as anybody would really like, but still be able to do it. Uh, so I think that with all of that said, I'm actually pretty hesitant to make changes at this table right now based on the, the enormity of the calculations that have taken place already. Um, I'm not saying that I'm not open to the discussion, but I'm hesitant to do so. So that's, yeah, go ahead, Ms. Farber. Just one feedback in terms of all the changes from the state legislature that take some of our authorities away and are managing our budget for us, which is very uncomfortable for any organization, I must yeah. admit. Um, some of these things will not actually be implemented probably until next year. Right. Um, and I think that it's very important for us to make sure that we have the correct financial foundation for projects going forward. Um, and I agree, Mike and, and Jennifer have done a superb job. They always do in terms of how they allocate their funding. Um, but there are times that we have actually asked for increase in, in staffing and projects. And I think just as a backup, it doesn't necessarily have to come to fruition that we use all of those dollars. Uh, but I think um, any business, if you will, always has kind of a, uh, a backup, uh, if you will, just in case. And in this case, it will go totally away if we don't decide to use it through the course of the budget. But we have not heard all the budgeting information. Right. We have not heard all of the potential hiccups in terms of increase in pricing and sourcing of materials for some of these things or just what it's going to take to, to get our, our feet on the street and get it up to par uh, for the city um, and for our public safety. Sure. So I'm still supporting uh, increasing that number. Okay. One more quick question, then I'll come back to you, Mr. Resnick. Um, there is, a, there is a ceiling that we have, right? We can only raise it so far before we have to have a supermajority vote, correct? That is correct. And what is that ceiling again, remind me? It's 102 or 103. 2%. 2%. It's 2%. 102. 2%. So 102. 2%, right, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Resnick? Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, I agree with you that I believe Mr. Van Milligan and his team understands the state of flex that we're in and uh, understands all the aspects that you mentioned. Uh, so, I mean, I support Mr. Van Milligan's original number, but I wouldn't support a cushion. I, I imagine that he has, uh, like you have mentioned, thought about that very carefully before it came to us tonight. Thank you. Other thoughts? All right. Uh, Ms. Farber, you've alluded to an amendment. Do you? All right, so, Karina, could you help me craft the amendment? So if you wanted to make a motion to amend this, mm -hmm. it would be to amend the column budget year proposed maximum property tax 2023-2024. Oh, and it would be in the total tax levy row that currently reads 26321-601. May I ask another question? I have 26623475. Say that Maybe again. I'm looking at the wrong paragraph here. I'm looking at the chart in the notice of public hearing. Maybe I have the wrong chart. Oh, yeah, the memo has the, the memo has your number. The 26, the memo does. So, okay, what is that number again? And I can. 26, 321, So it's the total tax levy for. Plus, plus. For 23, 24. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Plus the amount. Yeah, hang on real quick. Yeah, I am going to ask Jennifer to look at that discrepancy in the number. So. The number in the memo doesn't match the number in the chart. So the number in the memo is the total 
uh, property tax levy includes the debt service levy, which is excluded when we set the maximum tax levy resolution. So that would be the difference between the public hearing notice and the memo. Thank you. So, so the number I, that is our base then is the 321601 number? Yes, correct, yes. Okay. Want me to try this now? Go okay. for it, Ms. Farber. Right. Yes. So I move to amend the total tax levy or the maximum total tax levy from two twenty six million three hundred and twenty one thousand six oh one by how about two hundred and twenty five thousand to make it more palatable here for some of these folks. Okay. So increasing that number by 225,000, yep. thank you. All right, so we have a motion to amend by Ms. Farber. I'll second. We have a second by Ms. Roussel. Okay. Um, discussion on this amendment? All right, so we have a motion and a second to amend that, um, that, tax, that total tax levy. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Aye. Resnick? No. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? No. Roussel? Aye. And that motion passes 5-2. So the, the levy, total tax levy is um, adjusted to add $225,000. All right, so that brings us back to our original motion to receive and file and then set this property tax rate. Do we have any further discussion after this discussion? All right. In that case, then, uh, the motion was made just to, for reference by Ms. Roussel, seconded by Ms. Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. That motion passes 7 0. We will move on to our. Sorry. So no. there's the second, the second. motion yes. on this item that uh, is out there. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Mr. I move Jones. to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. And, and there's another piece down there for setting the public hearing, if you would. And set the public hearing for February 20th, 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Second by Sprank. So we have a motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Sprank. And the only thing I would add is that's when they, when they talk about sausage making, that's basically what just happened. So sorry for the, thank you very much to everybody's patience. We appreciate that. Um, what actually happened was a very important discussion. Um, and it was the first of 11 meetings that we are going to be having about this. So um, plenty of time for public input. So thank you very much for everyone's patience. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to our um, other items set for public hearings. And we have two. Resolution setting a public hearing on a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Seipel Warehouse LLC, providing for the sale of city-owned real estate to Seipel Warehouse LLC and the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement for February 20th, 2023. And second is setting a public hearing for the adoption of the Public Housing Authority Annual Plan for fiscal year 2024 for April 3rd, 2023. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates and times specified. Second. And a motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have applicant review for the Zoning Board of Adjustments and appointments for the Civic Center Advisory Commission, the Community Development Advisory Commission, and the Housing Commission. Okay, so our first is the uh, review for the Zoning Board of Adjustments. We have one five-year term and one applicant, Rena Stearman. Do we have anyone present to address the council on this item? Anyone virtually? We do not. Okay. Ms. Stearman did submit written input to the council regarding her application. Thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, then we can move on then to the boards and commissions appointments. Uh, the first is the Civic Center Advisory Commission. We have one three-year term open through June 29th, 2024. We have three applicants. So what we can do is we'll have Adrian call the roll, and if we could each name who we would like to appoint to this, we will uh, each get a choice. So Adrian, please. Jones. 
This is very difficult because there's three outstanding applicants. I'm going to say Jesse Gavin. Sprank. Uh, Daniel Jacobs. Wethel. Jesse Gavin. Resnick. Peter Gale. Farber. Jesse Gavin. Kavanaugh. Jesse Gavin. Roussel. Daniel Jacobs. So Jesse Gavin is appointed to the three-year term on the Civic Center Advisory Commission. The next is the Community Development Advisory Commission. We have two three-year terms through February 15th, 2026, and we have two applicants. So I will entertain a motion on this one, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Will the Kelly Fox be reappointed and that Gabriel Mozina be appointed for the positions applied for? Second. Second by Spring. And we've got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Kelly Fox and Gabriel Mozina are both appointed to the Community Development Advisory Commission. And finally, we have the Housing Commission. We have two <coughs> three year terms through August 17th, 2024. We have three applicants. I'm going to make sure everybody knows there's one applicant on the back there. So we have uh, Ross Janes, Calvin Jones, and Julieta Scott. Now, there are two separate terms here one is a vacant at large term, and the other is a vacant Section 8 term. Um, and we'll note who qualifies for what by looking at the sheet there. So um, let's go with the uh, vacant at large term first, please. And I will ask Adrian to call the roll. Um, and we can choose a person for that role. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. Let's go with the vacant section eight term first, uh, if that's okay with everybody. That I think that makes it a little bit cleaner. So, vacant section eight term is what we're voting on right now. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Calvin Jones. Sprank. Calvin Jones. Wethel. Calvin Jones. Resnick. Calvin Jones. Farber. Calvin Jones. Kavanaugh. Calvin Jones. Roussel. Calvin Jones. Calvin Jones is appointed to the three-year term through August 17th, 2024. So we will now go through the other term, and we have two candidates remaining. So um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Ross Janes. Sprank. Julietta Scott. Wethel. Julietta Scott. Resnick. Julietta Scott. Farber. Ross Janes. Kavanaugh. Ross Janes. Roussel. Ross Janes. So Ross Janes is appointed to the uh, at-large three-year term on the Housing Commission. Thank you all. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there's any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there's any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is resolution of adoption for the proposed urban renewal plan for the Twin Valley Urban Renewal Area. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second. We've got a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt the attached resolution of adoption for the urban renewal plan for the Twin Valley Urban Renewal Area. The proposed plan will provide for the use of tools that encourage investment and development activities in the area and support revitalization within the area and the community at large. The proposed $33 million project, which would be done by the McCoy Group, will create a 78,370 square foot headquarters office and create at least 18 new full-time jobs. Additional funds from the area will pay for needed traffic improvements in the area. I concur with the recommendation and respect for the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider city council adopt the attached resolution of adoption for the urban renewal plan for the Twin Valley urban renewal area. Do we have anyone in chambers to address the council on this item? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No virtual comments. Okay. And no input received. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for discussion. Seeing none, got a motion by Jones, second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. 
Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number two is resolution approving a proposed development agreement <coughs> by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and Switch Development, LLC for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt the attached resolution approving a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Switch Development, including the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations <coughs> pursuant to the development agreement. The key elements of the development agreement include the following. Number one, the developer must construct 18,000 square feet of office commercial space and 7,500 square feet of retail buildings to be completed by June 30th, 2024. Number two, the city agrees to design and construct the required intersection improvements as shown on the attached conceptual drawings. The estimated cost of the required improvements is $610,000. Required intersection improvements include but are not limited to turning lanes, lane widening, median modifications, traffic signals and controls, underground utilities, crosswalks, and curb ramps. Number three, the city agrees to make a good faith effort to construct the required inter intersection improvements so that they are operational by November 30th, 2023. Number four, the developer agrees to place $400,000 in escrow to be utilized for the construction of the required intersection improvements including but not limited to engineering, right-of-way acquisition and construction. Number five, developer agrees to pay one-third, not to exceed $200,000 of the actual cost of the required intersection improvements. Number six, commits to providing some, some, the, city can, the city commits to providing semi-annual tax increment financing rebate payments to the developer beginning in November of 2025 but only until the developer has been reimbursed to having paid one third of the actual cost of the required intersection improvements. Seven, the developer agrees to dedicate to the city by plat all street of right of way necessary for the construction of the improvements. Number eight, the developer is responsible for and must pay for all costs related to construction of the required sewer extension. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council adopt the attached resolution approving a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and Switch Development LLC, including the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? We do not. And no input received. Thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. Hearing none, we have a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in person attendees, Please approach the podium and state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. All right, thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, so I think we're gonna have some public input tonight. So before we get started, I just wanna make sure that I, I say the same thing I've been saying in the last couple of meetings. Um, you know, there's some items on the agenda this evening. Um, I think they've got some, uh, there've been some uh, emotional attachment to, to kind of the things that we're, that we're talking about. Um, and, and that's that's great. I think that's fine. I think um, some of this stuff we're going to be passionate about, and that's important that we have a good discussion. That is why we're here, is to have a good discussion about this. So as you come up and talk, there's a couple things I do ask. Um, is if 
as you make your argument, try and stick to your argument. Uh, please refrain from attacking any one of us, attacking anybody else, um, attacking anyone by name. I just think it, it does a couple of things. For one, uh, it doesn't help your argument at all. And the second thing is it really, uh, I think it, it lowers the amount of uh, civil discourse that we're able to have in this chamber. So I just ask that you keep things civil as you come up. Uh, we really do want to hear from you, so we, I hope that we do hear from a number of you this evening. So with that said, if you do come to the podium, I'll invite anyone who'd like to start, come on up, and then um, you can just name, uh, please state your name and address, and um, let, let us know what you have. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council, City Manager, uh, Ryan Semph. Uh, here for the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, 300 Main Street, uh, Suite 200. Uh, so I'm speaking tonight on action item number three, um, and we're not here to support or oppose uh, the proposal, um, but here just to ask for additional time uh, to garner feedback from the business community on the proposal. Um, and also just to um, suggest as we think about um, how we you know calm traffic on some of these uh, thoroughways that uh, council has also looked at uh, the central avenue master plan and recently uh, made action to kind of move forward with that a lot of the proposals in that are around complete streets and um, that will have more natural uh, traffic calming measures that come along with them you know maybe more narrow streets wider sidewalks that'll help protect protect pedestrians, um, adding of trees, things like that. So as we think about how we move forward with uh, proposals like this, we ask you to kind of weigh how that will impact some of the other plans and the impact that those plans will have on your, the stated goals. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Appreciate your comments. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. My name is Rob McDonald, and I reside at 3399 Eagle Point Drive. I'm here tonight uh, to speak against the recommended approval of automated speed cameras tonight. I feel they're, like the previous speaker, there's more information to be gathered. Uh, as, as stands tonight, there are a few specifics regarding uh, revenue sharing camera placement vendors to be considered, bid process, or fine schedule. Um, this has appeared to move along very quickly. Uh, from what I gathered on the agenda, the memo was sent from the police chief to the city manager just last Thursday, and it was forwarded that same day to the mayor and council. This short notice, in my opinion, makes for bad optics. And citizens will wonder why such a interesting, I won't use the word controversial, but interesting ordinance is forwarded and approved so quickly. I would ask you give this ordinance the time it deserves to contemplate and to look at the entire picture before moving tonight with just a small part of the picture. What's the hurry? The mayor and council and the citizens you all represent should have more information before approving just a small part of a much larger picture. And as a business person, the last thing I'd want a potential vendor to know is that cameras are approved and they're coming to town. I would want the leverage with the vendor to pursue the most attractive deal in order to be able to sell the concept to these seven people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for your comments. Good evening, <clears throat> Council. Good evening. My name is Paul Uzel. I'm in 61 uh, North Algona, uh, the major speedway between University Avenue and Dodge Street. I would love to have a camera on that street. Um, I recognize the problems that have just been mentioned about the speed of the process and the placements and a lot of the details that maybe need to be done. But there are many of us in the community who have lived under these kinds of things before. I myself have been a recipient of the uh, Citizen Police Academy program as well as the City Life program. 
And I saw that array of pictures of intersections that are monitored, and I thought, wouldn't that be great if that was on Algona? Um, I understand the, 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 the distrust of the institution that is endemic in our, our country right now. And I happen to be delighted to live in Dubuque. Okay, let's underscore that. I am delighted to live in Dubuque and to have this kind of an opportunity. If you don't do the crime, you don't have to worry about doing the time. Stay under the speed limit and you don't have a problem. I trust the machines to work like they're supposed to. I've lived in Waterloo and I've been, like I say, under other cameras before. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I'm most concerned about on Algona is that it is barely four lanes wide. Take up two of those with uh, parking, which a lot of people do, but they don't have the garages, and everybody starts putting their mirrors in. Why do they put their mirrors in? I've lost two mirrors. Uh, that's why they put their mirrors in. And then we don't have that many kids living in our neighborhood right now, but it's not going to sell property if that speedway gets noticed by a young family who wants to move in there with children. Next door, I do have one, they're rental. Uh, and I'm delighted to have them. They got this great big huge bidler truck that he drives on the call. And that gives me a little security. But I would like to see cameras, even if it takes the time to implement them and get them set up and give proper input, I think I speak probably for a large number of this population that says, we need them. We need them. Thank you, Paul, for your comments. Hello. My name is Tom Kedzie. I live at 1810 Amelia Drive. I sent all of you a letter today because I think my, I express myself better in writing than in speaking. And I wanted to thank Mrs. Roussel for responding and acknowledging receiving it. Thank you. Um, I made several points, but I want to kind of condense this to what I think are some of the most serious ones. I lived in the Chicago area up until several years ago when we moved to Dubuque. So I have had some personal experience with red light cameras and speed cameras. One thing I want to make clear is that these can destroy a person with limited means. The $100 fine is the first part. If you're not able to pay it in a month, it's $200. Ultimately, if you can't pay the $200, your car will be impounded, you will lose your driver's license, your car will be towed, and we know that the costs of having your car taken out of the pound can be over $1,000 easily. In this way, you can actually destroy a person's life with this bill. I think that's important to keep in mind because it seems like there's a regular little, in the police explanation, there's a procedure, but ultimately it doesn't stop anywhere. Okay, I want to make that clear. Another thing, Dubuque already has 1,300 surveillance cameras. Most people understand the need and value of surveillance in the name of public safety. From the city's point of view, these cameras cost a lot of money and bring in absolutely no revenue. Um, speed cameras offer a free opportunity to monetize the surveillance of our citizens, meaning this gives us an opportunity to make money off of surveilling people. Uh, philosophically, is this the proper role of government in our society? surreptitiously surveilling and extracting fines from the citizens. The third thing I wanted to say was one of the problems with speed cameras and ultimately red light cameras is the revenue becomes addictive. Um, why have only five cameras when you could have 20 cameras? You can put speed cameras in front of every school, okay? Um, I was just reading an article that the city of Chicago, I'm sure we will never arrive at this point, but the city of Chicago um, earned over $3 million from speed cameras in front of schools. So again, this looks very attractive, but is it really worth the cost? Uh, I think that's basically it. In my opinion, just one last thing, the serious shortage of police officers does, has nothing to do with speed cameras. 
if I were to make a call to the police in an emergency, would the response be we'll send someone as soon as we can, but we're making good money off our speed cameras? Now, I know that sounds a little cynical, and I'm sorry. As I read it, it's more uh, serious than I intended it to be. The shortage of officers is what the department should be focusing on, not speed cameras. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom, for your comments. Anyone else this evening? Good evening. My name's Neil Henson. I live at 350 West 6th Street, number 11. And I gotta agree, the speed cameras are not the answer. I understand we need more officers, and I would like to have more officers. But the cameras aren't the answer. I have surveillance systems. I got a chip full of footage that has been, nothing's been done with it, of different violations, and they can't do it. There's always an excuse of why it can't be done and dealt with. Now, I don't see where the cameras are going to help if they're not helping for individuals. Um, I would like to see the money put towards more officers. There are times that I am driving down the road and I realize I'm speeding, but that's because I'm watching traffic more than my speedometer. It's not on purpose. I think for the most part, the people that do want these cameras are people that are, have um, guns and drugs with them because now they're not getting caught with them. Most of the pullovers that happen, they find this stuff. If they're not getting pulled over and they're just getting mailed a ticket, these people are getting away with things. And that upsets me more. I understand there's a problem with speeding, but I don't think it's deliberate in most part. I think most of the time people are just trying to make it to the next light to get to where they're going. They're not deliberately speeding and they're not constantly monitoring their speedometers. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for your comments. Anyone else? Do we have any virtual input this evening? We do not. Okay. We have received some written input regarding action item number three from the following individuals. Paul Kern, Terry Mozina of 196 Bluff Street, Frank Belcastro, Paul Hemmer of 2375 Simpson Street, Tim and Amanda Powers of 255 Southgate Drive, Rob McDonald, Jamie Carr of 945 Clark Drive, Keith, Keith Wolf of 3188 Highland Park Drive, and Randy Heffel. Thank you very much, Adrian. All right, last call. Any chance to comment on anything that's on the action items agenda this evening or anything else? Okay, then we'll move on to action items, Adrian. Thank you. Action item number one is Dubuque Police Department Awards and Recognition Program. Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file and uh, see the presentation. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Um, Mike? Yes, thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Um, Chief Jeremy Jensen and Lieutenant Brendan Welsh are going to make a presentation about the uh, Police Department Annual Awards and I would like to tell you that I was privileged to be at that annual awards event and uh, I would like to offer my congratulations and gratitude to the officers who received those awards, many of them who are here tonight and I look forward to the presentation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council, uh, Police Chief Jeremy Jensen. And I'm not going to say a whole lot here because I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Welsh, but uh, it's really this night, it's the second annual one. It's a night for us to celebrate us. Uh, we don't get to do that very often. 24-7, uh, 365, we don't get to see each other together much. So it's one of those things that uh, we're able to do, and uh, it was a great night. So I'm going to let Lieutenant Welsh uh, give the presentation. Thanks. I'm just going to click back here. It looks like we advanced somehow. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Staff. Um, like you mentioned, my name is Brendan Welsh. I'm a Lieutenant with the Police Department, and I've been a member of the um, Awards and Recognition Committee since 2010. Um, tonight, we're gonna give you a brief history on the program, um, our awards program, as well as this past year's recipients, let you know what our officers were doing this last year and the impact that they had on the community. <clears throat> 
The awards and recognition program was established by the late Chief Mark Dalsing in 2010 with the intent to improve upon how we recognize the achievements and great actions of our officers and staff. This all started with the Chief assembling an initial research committee tasked with looking into our agency's awards program, um, identifying physical award vendors, the creation and definition of our own awards, the corresponding device for each award, creation of a policy and establishing a system for submitting officer recommendations, a review process and a means of issuing these awards. In its infancy, an, award, an awarded officer will be presented with their award at the start of their shift in front of their peers. This has morphed into what we have now, which for our second consecutive year, like the chief mentioned, um, involves a formal award ceremony. Here's an example of several of our more distinguished awards, although these seven awards are only a few of the ones that we created and provided definitions for. The awards night programs that I provided to you all provide more information on the other awards that are contained within this program. The process and award system that we selected closely replicates what you may find with the traditional military awards program or the awards program of some of the major US police departments. Although it's uniquely designed with uh, what we wanted to designate as recognizable, commendable acts from our officers and staff. All of our awards are accompanied by a definition of actions that would fit that specific awards criteria within our policy. Officers and supervisors are encouraged to read the awards criteria throughout the year and nominate peers displaying the defined actions for these awards as the incidents occur. Committee members meet monthly to review submissions and vote on whether the reported acts fit the criteria defined within policy per the award that the nominee was put in for. Again, not all awards are pictured here. Um, for example, unit specific awards for peer support members, um, people on that team, the honor guard members, firearms instruct instructors, et cetera, would all have their own designated um, ribbons to recognize their involvement in those specialty units as well. Um, and you can see more of those if you re uh, refer to that packet that we provided to you. Um, as mentioned, this was our second year hosting um, an actual awards and recognition night. This was for our recipients and the family members. It was held just over two weeks ago on July 19th. The intent was to create a space where the recognized officers, their families, and their peers could get together to bond, to make memories, and to celebrate our officers. We also had professional family photos taken by Wes Schilling, a Dubuque photographer who donated his time and his talents. And also Felicia Carner from the city was there to, to help out with her uh, photographic talents as well, preserving our memories that night. Not only does the event involve the awards program, but we also introduce family members to our resources, our chaplains, our peer support officers, brain health initiatives, and discussions with Dr. Nicole Keedy, one of our brain health partners. During the actual award ceremony, there are several formalities, including the presentation of colors from our honor guard, opening remarks from our departmental chaplains and from, uh, from our chief, as well as the recognition of past year's promotions, the retirements, anniversaries, and the actual presentation of the past year's awards. This year we had multiple, I'm sorry, this year we had a unique surprise as well. Involved at the end, uh, end of the event, we were contacted by a musician named Stokes Nielsen. Uh, Stokes is a BMI award-winning producer, Grammy-nominated songwriter, song writer, and three-time Academy of Country Music Award nominees from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he's taken on a side project of helping recognize first responders all over the country by showing his appreciation for them and what they do. Stokes found out about our event and traveled to Dubuque that night from Nashville to provide an hour-long performance following our event for our DPD family members, um, and he brought one of his bandmate, bandmates as well. He did all this on his own dime, so that was a pretty cool end to our, end to our night. Um, looking at past awards here, I have listed, um, your program also spells out those officers recognized for receiving awards in the past, the past 10 or 12 years, and it also outlines the officers awarded this year. For the year 2022, we had three officers recognized with some may consider our version of the Purple Heart or injured on duty recognition. Three officers re uh, received a police accommodation award. 13 officers received a certificate of merit and six officers were recognized with a life-saving award. Due to time constraints, uh, I won't be able to review each award that we gave this year, um, but I've selected two awards we wanna highlight. Again, all other awarded officers are mentioned in that program that we provided to you, so I encourage you to check that out. The first one we'll review involves the life-saving award and officer Matt Gamperl. On May 30th, 2022, at 11.30 hours, Officer Matt Gamperl responded to a report of an infant that had drowned in the bathtub. Upon arrival, Officer Gamperl was directed to a seven-month-old infant lying on the floor. Officer Gamperl immediately assessed the infant and determined the infant was not breathing and had no pulse. Officer Gamperl administered life-saving CPR to this infant for approximately two minutes prior to the arrival of the Dubuque Fire Department, who took over life-saving measures. As a direct result of Officer Gamperl's life-saving action, 
the child is alive today. The final award we will review involves Officer Tyler Breitbach and his receipt of the Certificate of Merit Award. Tyler is actually one of your security officers out in the lobby tonight. On July 30th, 2022, Officer Tyler Breitbach responded to Sam's Club, Sam's Club for what he believed to be a vehicle bur burglary. There were no signs of forced entry, but an autistic child was missing their stuffed animal, which was very important to the child. Calls for service prevented further follow-up at that time, so Officer Breitbach demonstrated personal initiative to look into matters further during his off-duty time. Officer Breitbach viewed cameras and identified the person that picked up the stuffed animal, contacted that person, and coordinated the return of the stuffed animal. Officer Breitbach did not seek any attention for his actions, and his involvement was only discovered due to a thankful social media post by the child's family. Those are just a thumbnail of what your officers did this year, and I wish we had all night to tell you more stories. That's a brief summary um, of, our, of our awards program, the history of it, um, and also this year's um, recipients. So if you guys have any questions regarding the awards this year or our program in general, let us know. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Welsh, for that presentation. Sure. Any questions or discussion this evening? Ms. Barber. Yeah, 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 I just want to thank you and all of your um, officers that are here tonight with us to help celebrate. So congratulations to everybody and thank you for all that you do for us in the city. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. So I think um, this moment uh, deserves a standing ovation for the officers uh, who have won awards this year. So thank you very much for your service. I know I speak for everybody when uh, everybody was sitting up here and, and, and for our entire community and saying thank you. Thank you for the service that you provide every single day. Uh, you know, we get a lot of an opportunity to be able to interact with you at a lot of different community events. And I'm always so appreciative to see you out there in the community working with people. But one of the things that we don't always get to see are the things that you do every single day. Um, you know, we, we try to pay as close attention as we possibly can. We listen closely to Chief Jensen and, uh, you know, the things that, that we hear up here. But, um, you know, the work that you do, a lot of it is, it, it does go without thanks. It does go without recognition. So to see this and to see you celebrating each other in this way, I'm, I'm so happy that this is the case. And I, I look forward to you doing this for years to come. But thank you very much for your service. Uh, this is just incredibly important. And this review is something that I'm glad we were able to share with the entire community tonight. So thank you. We can move on to, uh, oh wait, actually, I probably need to vote on this one. Eh? So uh, we have a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank to receive and file and uh, review that presentation. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is 2022 police recruiting, hiring, and retention. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and receive the presentation. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Farber. Mike, please. <clears throat> Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, and I'm just introducing Chief Jensen, who will talk about the recruiting, hiring, and retention. Thank you, Mike. Good evening. Chief Jeremy Jensen again. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about... Uh, our recruiting, our hiring, and our retention. Uh, as maybe you remember, back earlier this year, I talked about it. We had a goal to try to hire 20 officers by the end of 2022. Now, uh, last, let me back up, 2021 in the fall, we tested. We established a list. We were able to hire some people off that list. We have not had a 20-person list. We're, up, we're allowed up to 40. We have not even come close to that in recent years. In the spring, we again tested after six months again. Uh, we made more job offers, hired more people. Uh, all in all, I gave 17 conditional job offers in 2022, 18 counting one we gave at the end of 2021. Now of that, what I have now still a vacancy of, which I began 2022 at 17 officers down, I have 13 vacancies still. The math doesn't seem to add up here. You know, uh, hiring is, is difficult. There's a number of reasons. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this under all under the staffing, but I wanna talk about things separately, particularly like hiring and retention separately. Um, hiring, when we talk about the hiring side of that thing, so there's some difficulties. First, first thing is, it's, diff, it, it's not cool to be a cop right now. There, there's some national rhetoric. We don't feel it here in Dubuque. I mean, we, we feel supported, but it does bleed in. It, it's just not 
it's not the, the job to be in. There's a number of other factors, and, and other people can talk about that a, a lot better than I can, but you talk about uh, a good economy. There's things like that where jobs are easier. I can go work a job and work regular hours during the regular week, and I don't have to come work nights, holidays, and weekends for the same pay. Uh, there's some generational things where, or even the job market itself, where the job market is just rotating. Okay? And, and I'll talk about this a little bit here, a little bit more in a second, but it takes us a year to train a police officer from the time we give the conditional job until we get them in the door until we get them trained, about a year. It, it's a crazy amount, but that's a good thing. I mean, we want our officers to be trained because untrained officers, bad things happen. And so we wanna make sure we have them trained and ready to be out there to serve the community. But, you know, so we have that. We have that job market that's, that's kind of revolving. And if you, there's a study that's out from the International Association, or not a study, but a recommendation from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which is the biggest organization we have, that's saying just plan on your, on your rotation being five, six years, okay? So if you look at that, our staffing in general, I'll talk about this in budget a little bit, but about 75% of our patrol division has less than five years on the job, you know? Uh, we're young. Uh, we're, we're new to this job. So that's the kind of market we're seeing. Uh, the hiring side of it, we recruit. We recruit, we recruit, we recruit. We recruit individuals. We have a recruiting team that's just a dedicated bunch of officers, uh, all levels. They go out, they have, they have identified areas to recruit in. Uh, the majority of our, high, our, our recruitment starts at colleges, though we recruit non-traditional. If somebody comes to us with a name of a person that we they say, I think they'd be a good police officer, we'll recruit that person. We'll try to stay in contact with them. We'll try to bring them onto the job. I mean, it's that, that important and that dire for us to do that at this point in time. Um, but to give you an example where this recruit, so we tested in, in November, uh, established a list of, so we had 20 some applicants, 29 applicants, I think. Um, we ended up with 14 people actually ending up to show up to take the testing that day. Only seven passed. Now, since that list got established of seven people, Three people withdrew their names. And now off that list, I've given three conditional job offers. Now, what we run into, too, is we have a background check. Our background check needs to be extensive. We have very strict requirements on who we can hire and some requirements with that. So that takes a couple months. So I have conditional job offers out for two people that are going to be coming on in March and another one that potentially will be on later in the summer, but there's some military obligations that, that have to be fulfilled there. Uh, I've given job offers out for uh, up to a year, but this leads to the second part. So now we run into some legislative issues, okay? So we have a civil service list that's established. I have to make the conditional job offer before the civil service list expires. We've been doing them for six months. Once that list expires, we have to retest. The other part of that is the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy, which has very specific, goal, or specific requirements, which means they have to take a written test, pass with a score of 70%. The test is established by the state and then the physical fitness test, which is also established by the state, which consists of a mile and a half run, push-ups, sit-ups, uh, and then that's based upon your age and gender. So that's how that gets dictated. We don't have any say in that. They have to have that in order to go to the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy. Um, quite honestly, we're running into some issues with that. For the written test itself, there's some things, particularly the math part, people are failing at. Not because they don't know math, because you think about it, it takes them longer. They're taught differently than I was taught. I was taught to do math in my head. That's not necessarily how this goes at, at this point in time. They're also using electronic devices, which the test does not allow. Does not allow for a calculator to do that. Um, so you, we run into that. So at the time, again, not because they don't know it, it just takes longer and they run out of time. Um, there's some grammar issues. Well, what's that? You know, if you look at it, the, you know, the written test is set up to do that, but when we write for particularly college and things like that, we actually have spell checker. We have uh, grammarly, we have different things that help us get through that. So there's a little bit with that that we're seeing. So there, there's that that's, uh, that's an issue, it's a challenge for us. The physical fitness test, we lose a lot of people through that, to be honest. Uh, it, it's tough for us, uh, it's tough for everybody. This is not just a Dubuque problem, I shouldn't say this is a statewide problem, anybody that has to, to use these things. Um, but, you know, we have that. So that, that's a, a hiring thing that we run into. Um, again, then once we get them in place, we need to train them. So the academies are 17 weeks long right now. So they have to attend an Iowa Law Enforcement Academy to be certified. They have to attend within one year. They have to attend that academy within a year of taking the test. So we can use transfer test scores 
but if they took it outside of ours, we have to watch that year date. And we actually ran into this as a problem. Luckily, we have our own person in uh, the clerk's office, Pam McCarran, who can score the test and we're able to do, um, administer a test and keep somebody in an academy. They're actually in the academy when this got brought up. So we have that. Uh, you know, we run into, um, so once we, like I said, we do the field training program. So when, as we go into that, we've been really looking at what we do with that. Uh, really revamping. Traditionally, it's 20 weeks long on the backside. We have a checklist. We have all these tasks that we need to go through. With that, we identify core tasks. You need to know these to be out on your solo patrol, but also with that, we need to identify, um, are they capable? So testing them out of it, so to speak. Um, so we score that, but we're looking at how we, we do that. So this is traditionally the order is, again, you get the conditional job offer, we do the back contract, we give you a higher date. Within a couple weeks, we send you to an academy for 17 weeks, we bring you back and do 20 weeks of field training. So what, what we're looking at here, and this is one of the, the things we've had happen, is that we're able to use our community resource officers, the red shirts, paid interns. We hire a lot of them. It's an extended <coughs> job interview when we bring them in. Well, we now formalized what we're doing with them with training. And now recently, in the middle of January here, uh, one of our com community resource officers, actually some of our ex ones are here in the audience today, but uh, uh, we're actually going to have her pretty much fully trained before she goes to the academy. We're trying to maximize our time. We're trying to be more efficient, more effective. We also have a learn as you go part of the field training program. So if somebody is really excelling at it, we're moving them on in the field training side. Uh, Another area we're looking at doing is, is certified officers. So um, we don't have many certified officers come to Dubuque, and we have some incentives for that. Um, but there's, there's a couple things that we run into. So civil service side of things. Um, and this is one thing we've been working with legal with um, the clerk's office and, and human resources is determining can we add them to the list? Do they need to test uh, before we add them to the list? Because ILEA, which is the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy, says no. They're already certified in the state of Iowa. That's the requirement to do the ILEA. Now, civil service, we're looking at, can we add them to the list because do they need to test? So now we looked at that and then we have this interpretation where we can look at maybe some real-time hiring, which we never had. So again, we got a list up to 40. We may be able to add people to that list up until the time the list expires. We do run into people that run into time things. They get out of uh, the military or I'm looking for a job change, but I can't have a void in the time being away from a job. I need to be paid. So we were able to do that. So we're really trying to explore and, and see what we can do within the code, challenge some of that, um, and, and look at ideas of how we can bring more people on. Uh, but again, we, we need the numbers. We need people to, to show up. Um, you know, like I said, 13 vacancies. And, and like I said, it takes a year to replace somebody. That brings me to the retention part. So retention is the most important part to me. We have to stop the people leaving because it takes so long to replace them. So if somebody leaves today, it'll take me a year to replace them. You know, uh, being down 13 officers, and I, I want to point this out first and foremost, there shouldn't be any, most people are not seeing the effect of that because our service is still high. We're still solving crimes. We're still doing that at a high rate. And it's all credit because of all these officers out here. It really is because they take pride in it. They take pride in doing a good job. They take pride in making sure it's done, even when we're short. Even when we're short bodies and they're doing extra work, they still are the ones doing that and making sure that we haven't missed a beat on that. You know, and there's a number of reasons, again, for, for retention issues. And, and the first one I want to bring up is it, it's competitive wage. We saw sheriff's office and small departments this last year throw a lot of money at law enforcement. All of a sudden, they're getting paid where traditionally it used to be people came to the bigger cities to get paid more, more, more excitement and stuff. You know, um, quite honestly, officers are getting tired of the excitement a little bit. There's been a lot of that going on, and it gets that. So to go to other places that get paid equal or more and do less work, that's appealing, quite frankly. And, and that's what we're, we're seeing some of that. We're seeing officers, you know, and that's, to me, that's, that's important. You know, we're seeing this, um, and we're trying to stop that. You know, we don't want to give people a reason to leave. You know, another one is it's just easy to get a job. You can go anywhere now. You're a certified officer, you're marketable. Right now you can go anywhere, get a job anywhere. When I tested back in the early 1990s, and again, that's a list of 529, or 529 people. I found the actual thing where my testing score was on. 529 took the test for a 10-person list, and they hired seven people off of that list out of a two-year list. It's crazy. Now we're hiring so fast. But again, 
we didn't see the turnover we were seeing back then. Um, so, you know, we want to keep these officers. That, that to me, is it, here's the fir first and foremost. The second thing I said, it's easy for to go other places. Um, it just is. And, and we see people leave. They follow love. They follow family. They do different things. I mean, it happens that way. And again, it's easy to do. I could never have done that early on in my career, go back home. Couldn't have done it because there was no jobs. Um, easy to do. You know, and, there, and then there's just other things where it's just, like I said, it's just um, the, the perfect storm coming together here where it's, you know, um, you know, I'm just tired of being in the job. I just don't want it. This is not for me. Uh, you know, I'll move on to something different for, for the time being and, and, and try something. Um, you know, and, you know, so you, as we talk through this in 2023, we're really looking at, you know, what can we do? How can we do this? We, this hiring stuff is not going to go away. It's not going to go away in 2023. I mean, this, this is going to keep going, but we're, we're looking at all these options, you know. We're looking at what we can do to retain the people we have. And very, very important. Um, how, can we, how can we leverage what, what we have? Okay, so technology. I'm going to be talking about that next. But there's a lot of technology. Can we leverage what technology we have and what technology can leverage it so we can be a force multiplier on the officers? You know, uh, again, I'd love to throw more officers at things, but I need more officers to do that. And it, it takes time. So can we leverage things to do that? So um, again, we're looking at innovation. What can we do differently? What can we, how can we look at how we respond to things even in general, you know? Um, we spend a lot of time logistically traveling from point A to point B. Is there ways we can minimize that? Uh, we're looking at our resource allocation. How do we, how do we, what we, with what we have, how do we put them out on the street? So again, you don't see them miss a beat, or we don't miss a beat in service that we provide. And so, um, and then, you know, just finally, like I said, um, we're still hiring quality people. That's why I want to emphasize that. We're not hiring just numbers. We want to still hire quality police officers. And maybe I'm biased, but I, I think we have the best police department around, you know. And I think that that's, again, the kudos to the people. We hire the people. Um, I'm proud of the people that, that we have here, but I want to emphasize that it's quality. We're doing quality over quantity because quantity will not get us where we want to be. It's going to cause us more problems in the end. So any questions? Thank you very much, Chief. Discussion? Oh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I, I couldn't be more impressed with the quality I see it every day. And it's, it's impressive and it, it shows. And we hear about it from citizens. And I think you're on the, the right track. I think everything that you're doing is the right thing. And I think you've got too many um, restraints, once again, from state government to, to get where you need to get. Um, and then the, the restraint of, of available cash to, to make the job more attractive. I, I love what's, what's happening with the awards program. I think that's a, a great retention tool. Plus, it's, uh, it's recognizing things that are earned every day by the officers on the street. And, and again, what an impressive crew and what an, what an impressive uh, group of folks that are honored in this booklet. So thank you very much for all of that and keep us posted on what we can do to make it better. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I just wanted to point out, you probably re recognize this too, but we had a citizen here tonight. So to really appreciate what you do. You know, a simple stop could be, you know, just here's a ticket and go. But you really look things, the entire situation over to see what, you know, what can I do to make Dubuque a safer place? And uh, that, you can't get that with just um, things we're gonna talk about tonight. But that connection, I've also heard about uh, people, uh, citizens who uh, were stopped for uh, a problem with their headlight, but yet they had other problems and they were glad you really stopped them because they had some other issues they wanted, needed to talk to the police, uh, talk to a human being about. And uh, so that happens all the time here in Dubuque. You know, your, your team is looking out for our citizens, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Wethel, did I see your hand going up? You can go first. Oh. All right, Mr. Spring. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Spring. Uh, Thank you, Chief, and thank you to all, all the staff, what they're doing on the streets. We know it's not an easy job, and their families have a lot to take home with them as well. Um, I guess my question kind of comes down to, a, a kind of question looking at the numbers. You said you started with 29 down to four. You're still short, uh, you're still short 13. Theoretically, it's gonna take you three years-ish to get to those 13 numbers replaced. 
how many, do you have a ballpark idea how many officers are expected to retire in these next three years? So will you kind of always be behind or, and? I don't, but I, anecdotally, I can say probably five okay. off of that, just on retirements. Uh, and, and the nice thing with retirements, they're planned. Yeah. We have an idea what we can, we can do with that if we, I should say they're planned. The most of the time we get, get notice of that and we have an idea. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just the retirement side. And then you talk about, you know, I'm more concerned of the turnover, the, the, when they're turning over at four, five, six years. That's the concern. I, I just don't think right now the job market is that people are going to go 30 years like I do, you know? Thank you. Ms. Wethel. Um, thank you to all of the officers, to you, Chief, and for everyone that is out um, in their patrol cars and at the um, station taking care of us tonight. I hope that um, our community is listening. We have a lot of hard decisions to make about budget. And as a council, we made you a priority. And I intend to keep that priority. Um, hard decisions will have to be made regarding other things in our community. Um, but to me, your role is paramount, and um, saying thank you isn't enough, so I hope to do more. Thank you. Ms. Barber. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Jeremy, as you know, I, I um, support what um, Katie has just said, and indeed, uh, public service and public uh, safety is the number one priority. And, and as always, uh, a big thank you to you and your team, um, with whom we interact on a somewhat regular basis. And I've, I've known some of them for over eight years. Um, and so it's always a pleasure to have that interaction, that support, and just that general relationship uh, for small businesses here in Dubuque in particular. So it's greatly appreciated. Um, and I look forward to uh, continuing to help support so thank you. So a um, couple of things, Chief. First of all, thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's really important. I mean, you put a lot of stuff in this memo that's attached to this item as well that I think is really important for not just us, but as Ms. Methel mentioned, the whole community to know. Um, you know, it's, no, it's interesting. I've, I've noticed something in my time on the council, um, you know, since starting around, you know, 2020, um, you know, was a rough year in so many ways, but especially for police officers. Um, the, the discussion became pretty toxic towards police officers during that time. And something that struck me in a recent trip that I just took um, to the U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting in Washington, D.C., was a shift in tone that was a positive shift, in my mind, from cities uh, across the United States. This is not going to be all that helpful, by the way, just real quick. But it is looking forward. I see the tone shifting when I talk to other mayors and other council members from, from other places. Um, and I heard that same tone from federal legislators as well. Uh, I think the support for you and for all of you as officers and the work that you do is returning. You might not feel that yet, but I'm starting to see that um, from, from where I'm sitting. That said, though, I'm not entirely patient in waiting for the rest of society to catch up to um, the support that we have here. I mean, you, you're, you've heard unanimous support for your department from this desk, but support doesn't entirely translate into action, right? We have to do that. That's the part that we have to do. So I'm gonna ask you the tough question now. You know, ideally speaking, because I, I like to think in ideals sometimes it helps us to come down from where we'd really like to be. I mean, ideally what I'm hearing you say is, yes, of course, we would love to be the highest paid police force in the entire state of Iowa, maybe the entire region, right? Ideally, that'd be wonderful. Um, pretty tough to get to that point, but ideally that'd be great. Ideally, we're fully staffed. We have everybody that we need. I'm curious what that would look like. I mean, if we could talk about what that means as a community to us. I heard you say a couple of key things that, that might help us in this discussion, but you know, the technology's there to be able to support the work that you do in all of its forms. You know, we're gonna talk about an ad item that has to do with cameras up next, but that's only one piece of technology. We've also talked about um, tasers last year. We've talked about um, t you know, technology that comes in many forms in the cruisers that you use and a lot of the things that you do. You also talked about decrease in travel time, which I'm guessing if you have more staff, you don't have to travel as far to be able to get to a call and all those different things, be able to station more people in different places in the community, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also hearing just a general decrease in the overall workload that you have. I, I struggle to think of a much more stressful job than what you guys do. 
I, I just, you know, I sit here and try to think of it, and it's, and I'm a social worker. I've had some pretty tough, I've had a tough go of it in a few times, right? So, um, but it's nothing quite like the the danger you put yourselves in, the, um, the the challenges you have that come, and you know, Mr. Resnick alluded to all the different things that you see. You know, what else would it look like? I mean, what what do we need to think about as policymakers as we look forward to really providing the assistance that we're saying that we want to provide to you? You know, there's there's a lot of things, like you said, you, and you brought up a lot of them uh, on that. You know, there's it, the psychological side of this is, is is huge. You know, what does that look like? You talked about monetary. You know, that that's that's it too. You know, I don't want people have any reason to leave us. You know. But the other part is the, is the stress. There is a stress to this job. Um, we, have, we have great things in place with that. We have a peer support, we have an EAP program, we have a chaplain program, and the officers have, they really do just take care of each other. But when you talk about the decreased load, you know, we, and you'll see this with the budget, but roughly, we're, you know, we went down a little bit on the calls for service for the year. We're still over 50,000, which is still a lot. Um, you know, and the officer's downtime, because what's causing some problems nationally is this fact that just repeated high stress over and over, and there's no break in between, right? You go call to call to call, and nothing to de-escalate yourself, and no break within that, you know, and, and how, do we, how do we work with that? You know, again, that's leveraging, some of that's leveraging the technology, um, some of that's looking at what we're responding to. Because, one, you know, one of the things here in Dubuque, quite honestly, is that you call 911, we come. It doesn't matter what it is. It does not matter. We will show up. You know, and there's some things that's like, it's not, maybe not better, best served for a police officer to show up or the most efficient or effective way. We just act as the middle person in it. So then maybe there's things we can do with that. Um, but again, you know, leveraging the technology makes us just more effective and efficient. You know, that, that right now, and again, that's a whole goal for everything. Um, you know, a lot of the answers is throw, throw more police officers at it. Uh, but that is the question. Is that what we really want, you know, as, as we do want to get to our staffing because we do want to take this workload and, and stretch it out. Um, it's complex. That's the best way to put it. It is complex. It requires a lot of parts. There is no one part that's going to fix it. It has to be everything coming together. Well, and that's one of the big reasons I really appreciate starting this conversation in the way we're doing it tonight. You know, we have a lot of opportunities coming up here with budget discussions. We all know that those can um, get pretty expansive. So I, I'm looking forward to furthering this discussion in many ways. I think we're going to be, I think there's a lot of ways it's going to come to us. So I, I appreciate your answer on that. All right. We have a motion to uh, receive and file here that presentation uh, by Jones, second by Farber. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Sprank? Aye. Weffel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. We pass the 7 0. Thank you. Action item number three is automated speed cameras. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents, uh, receive the presentation, and uh, approve the recommendation. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief of Police Jeremy Jensen is recommending City Council implement automated speed cameras in the City of Dubuque. Traffic enforcement, particularly speed enforcement, is a frequent request of the Dubuque Police Department. The purpose of traffic enforcement, particularly speed enforcement, is to reduce the amount of motor, motor vehicle crashes and reduce the severity of those crashes by ultimately changing drivers' patterns of behavior. Motor vehicle crashes cause not only impacts to individuals in the form of injuries and monetary loss, they disrupt traffic flow, potentially cause additional crashes, and take a great deal of staff allocation and time to complete. In 2022, the Dubuque Police Department investigated 1,510 motor vehicle crashes. Six of those crashes were fatal car crashes, a 10-year high. Excessive speed was a contributing factor in almost all of these crashes. Data provided by the Governor's Traffic Safety Bureau shows that in Iowa, speed was a factor in many of the fatal crashes. Iowa State Patrol statistics for the last three years has shown an exponential increase in speed citations over 100 miles per hour. The police department receives on average two to three requests per week for speed enforcement. Currently, the department has 13 sworn officer vacancies. The department responded to over 50,000 calls for service in 2022. Traffic enforcement is a proactive activity with the necessity to respond to calls as a priority. Traffic enforcement is a secondary priority purely because of staffing issues. 
Police officer safety is an important issue. Traffic stops are one of the most dangerous activities officers partake in. Not only does the officer have to contend with an unknown driver, the officer also has to contend with other vehicle traffic. Additionally, traffic stops with flashing lights cause erratic behavior from drivers that has resulted in crashes as people slow, look, or erratically change lanes. Certain areas, such as Lower Dodge Street, that often generate speed complaints and are prone to crashes are often difficult and dangerous for officers to work traffic enforcement without further impacting traffic patterns. Racial profiling, pretextual stops, or allegations made around traffic enforcement as there is a human factor when an officer decides to stop a vehicle. Additionally, when an officer makes a stop on a motorist, the claim is that the officer, officer has now missed 10 other violations. Automated speed enforcement cameras are common in many cities throughout Iowa, such as Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, Des Moines metropolitan area, Waterloo, and Davenport, as well as a number of small towns. Cedar Rapids has had this technology for many years. Chief Jensen discussed the use and potential problems of the system with Cedar Rapids Police Chief Wayne German. Chief German advises that the system has had a positive effect on reducing motor, motor vehicle crashes. On a particular stretch of Interstate 380, fatal accidents went from five per year to one in 10 years. Cons of the system include not being popular with some people, it is not perfect, However, as stated before, there is oversight. A police officer is required to review the citations. There is an appeal process. Citations are issued to register owners, registered owners. Some people argue this is not fair to the owner as it may not be the owner driving the vehicle. Conversely, others would argue the owner is responsible for the use of their vehicle and who they allow to drive the vehicle. The benefits of automated speed enforcement include the following. First, it's 24-7, 365 day coverage of an area. Staffing does not allow for officers to sit in an area for this amount of time. Cameras are a force multiplier that offsets police department staffing issues and leverages technology. Second, there is a safety factor for both officers and motorists by not conducting physical traffic stops on often busy and high-speed roadways. Third, the cameras keep working during the time an officer would be out of service during that stop. Fourth, the citation is a civil citation that does not count against the driving record. The ultimate goal is to not have drivers suspended for non-payment of fines, but to have accountability that ultimately changes driving behavior. And finally, there is minimal or no cost to the city. The vendors of these systems do not charge for the installation or maintenance as they are paid by a percentage from each ticket issued, roughly 35% depending on the vendor. The benefit is this is a standalone system not related to our traffic camera system that is maintained by the vendor. The original submission of this memo, since the original submission of this memo, I've been asked multiple questions. My intent would be to recommend any revenue go towards traffic safety expenses throughout the organization and the community, including in public works where we have two full-time traffic technicians to maintain the traffic lights and the existing, existing traffic cameras, in engineering where we have traffic engineers, existing traffic camera staffing, design, maintenance, computer storage, software, and maintenance of the system, the police department has a three-member traffic unit and ancillary expenses. And then continuous planning, maintenance, and implementation of traffic safety enhancements throughout the community. Traffic safety includes the safety of the motoring public, bicyclists, and pedestrians. The city council budgeted in fiscal year 23, the current fiscal year, to create two new positions to deal with diversion to the City of Dubuque Notice of Violation System and the court system, so people can reduce their fines or avoid jail time by doing community service. One of the new positions is to, is to connect with people who need the diversion services, and the other is to develop a community service system 
So, so there is a system in place for that diversion to exist, and so that successfully performing that community service can be tracked. In the case of normal speeding tickets issued by a police officer, not through automated speed enforcement, a person speeding at 11 to 15 miles over the speed limit would be subject to a $175.15 fine. Higher speeds increase the fine. <clears throat> With automated speed enforcement, let's assume the fine for going 11 to 15 miles over the speed limit is $100 with higher fines for higher speeds, but the percentages I'm about to describe could still apply. The company providing all the equipment and processing the violations would get an estimated 35% or $35 of the $100, and there is no way to divert that through community service. However, my recommendation would be that the violator have the opportunity to divert 50% or $50 of the $100 fine. So of the remaining six, $65 uh, through community service, $50 could be diverted. Uh, the 15% or remaining $15, the city keeps would be used to cover the cost of the diversion program and any remaining go, going to traffic safety expenditures. The community service diversion opportunity would not only be for low income people, but all violators. In this example, there would be a $100 fine for automated speed enforcement for exceeding the speed limit between 11 to 15 miles per hour over the speed limit, but the person could do community service to avoid 50% or $50 of that cost. Even if this is approved tonight, it is not the last time it would come before the city council. Prior to any implement implementation, an ordinance would be required. The ordinance would cover the implementation, the fines, the limitations on the min minimum speed enforced, et cetera. And as you're well aware, uh, you can do ordinances in three readings. So if you were to approve this recommendation tonight at the uh, February 20th city council meeting, would come back to you an ordinance for you to review. And then you would have three meetings, including February 20th to consider that ordinance. Uh, the first meeting in March, and then the March 20th meeting, at which would be the third reading, when you could decide if you are going to adopt the ordinance and then officially actually implement this program. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval to implement automated speed enforcement, and Chief Jeremy Jensen does have a presentation. Thank you, Mike. If I can find it. Well, they're fixing this, but I guess the first question I'll just say is why? You know, why do I bring this to you? So I think your tasking to me as police chief is to look for public safety options. Plain and simple, that's my job is to do public safety. As I said before, there's looking at ways to be more effective and efficient. That's um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I, I need to do. Always looking how to do things better. Um, I love the word that was used tonight. I was gonna use contentious, but the word interesting is actually a better word. I like that word, so uh, whoever said that was, I like that word, because it is interesting. Um, this started for me, so if you remember back in July, uh, we had a high-speed crash on the Northwest Arterial that claimed the lives of three, three young people. And so at the end of September, uh, we did a joint uh, press conference with the Iowa State Patrol, the Sheriff's Office, the Governor Traffic Safety Bureau, during that conference, or after that conference, one of the mothers of the persons involved in that came to me and said, what can we do? We gotta do more, we gotta do more. You know, like I said, I can't, I can't sit out there. She told me the Northwest Arterial is a bad place. This is what happens, this, race, this racing along here. And what can we do that's other things we can do? So I started looking, um, started, what are other options we have to do this? We can throw officers out, but again, we're not there 24 seven. And, and, and I'll talk more about that. Like I said, it, it's, it's force multiplier. Quite frankly, um, it gives us, it covers areas that we can't cover. And I'll, and I'll cover some more of that, why that is. I'm just point this out. Speeding is a choice, plain and simple. It requires a driver's input to put their foot on the gas and go. Um, 
I'm just, I'm going to say this before even asking this. I'm asking drivers to slow down, voluntarily slow down. We don't even have to have this. I'm asking for them to voluntarily slow down. I said this during that press conference. If you just slow down, we don't have this as an issue. So here's some studies that kind of show it. And, and the thing with studies, and I want to throw this out with traffic, traffic safety studies, there's a lot of nuances that go with crash data. So speed can be a factor in one. But then type of vehicle, so weight of vehicle, and I'll show you some of that with that. Um, safety, you know, the age of the vehicle. Newer vehicles are safer. They're designed to be, you know, they're crash tested with more safety things. Um, Seatbelt use, that's another factor that plays into that. Distracted driving, and I'm not just talking about cell phones, and then, you know, the state's got some legislative um, going with that, but there's also the other things. What, what is distracted driving? Uh, um, music, playing with the radio, eating, there's distracted driving that goes into that. And a lot of that plays into crash is because there's reaction time. Recognizing when something is going to happen and be able to react, react to that takes time. And if I'm doing something else, there's even split seconds or seconds take, change a difference on that. It changes the amount of time it takes or the amount of distance it takes to stop on, on crashes. Add speed to that and um, you, you can see where that actually starts to, to, to change some of that. And again, I'll show you some data with that. But these are some studies, um, Nat National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the National Traffic Safety Bureau throughout. These are back from 2017. Uh, the one on the left is more of how to do an, a, a system, how to uh, get a system up and going. Um, I want to point out, this is not in lieu of traffic stops. There is benefit. As, as one gentleman pointed out, there is benefits to doing traffic stops. We find other things, quite frankly, uh, that go on with that. Um, this is just speed. It's not everything else that goes on. I talk about the other safety factor, factors. The GTSB is talking about, you know, slow down, uh, put it down, the, the electronic devices, uh, seatbelt use, and then move over. And you know, I'm going to talk about safety um, and the safety being alongside the road, particularly any roadway workers in general on that. Uh, so it talks about that, but it really does point out some things that you need to work on where you put them. You got to decide that. Use your data to decide where you're going to put these cameras. Um, identify where the problems lie. Um, the transparency. Um, my mind, there's no secret to these things. I, they go out, we tell you where, exactly where they're at. And, and multiply, multiply, again, again, the whole idea is if we never issue a citation, we're winning. Because with that, people are slowing down. We're not issuing citations within it. And then just documentation of it and keeping track of it. And then looking at the data and say, you know what, the, the, the nice thing with these things is they go in and they can come out. We can move them. We don't have to, or we don't need, and maybe we just said we're done with it. Um, the NT, NTSB study, um, it, it, it focused on some things. Again, with these crash nuances, but speed <laughs> increases likelihood of serious and fatal crash involvement. Um, speed increases the in injury severity of a crash. Um, these are all basic physics. Uh, the involvement of speeding uh, passenger vehicles and fatal crashes is underestimated and underreported. It's hard for us to figure out if somebody's speeding on a lot of these crashes. Again, 10 miles an hour, you can do some things with crash data, you can look at that. Our current traffic system, which are, are the camera system, I want to point out, we don't look at that for speeding. It's not designed for that. It's not calibrated. It's not any of that. That's, we can look at what the causation of the accident. We might have a good idea if somebody's really speeding. You can kind of figure that out. Um, but that's, that's there. Um, and they need to be highly, you know, highly publicized. Um, increased enforcement can, is an effective measure. I did traffic enforcement for three years. I know there's a, there's, you can do some things with that, but I was one person doing that on a whole city of Dubuque, you know. Speed kills, you've heard this. Here is the physics behind it. This is simple, simple physics. We wanna point out kinetic energy because kinetic energy is what causes death. I wanna point out on the right there, the weight of the vehicle. So it, it, we have the formula there for, for the kinetic energy, um, but look at the difference. So if you look at a 4,000 pound vehicle, that's the average vehicle weight. Traveling at 45 miles an hour, you can see the kinetic energy, 270,000 plus foot pounds. Um, the same vehicle traveling at 65, 20 miles an hour or more. So it's not double, but it almost, you start to get into that range where it's, where it's doubling the kinetic energy. The speed's not doubling. That goes up. Kinetic energy is the impact. Again, that's what happens. Again, it can be mitigated through seatbelt use, uh, the vehicle makeup, and, and some of that sentiment. But this is the things that do that. Now, look at, look at 80,000 pounds. That's a commercial motor vehicle. 
on that. 25 miles an hour, 1.6 million foot pounds. Increase it by 10 miles an hour, and you're up over 3.2. That's why you see semi, oh, don't ever get hit by a semi. That literally is it, you know, that points that out. So I want to point that out there, because again, I think it's important to show why speed enforcement is important. This is a, what the city manager alluded to. The one on the left is the Iowa State Patrol. They use this at that press conference. Um, speed over 100, uh, crazy. Um, quite honestly, in 2020, they, what they're saying, what happened there is because of COVID and we were, weren't doing traffic stops because we didn't know if we were gonna get COVID from talking to people um, all across the state. Look at the number. They, they called it a free for all on the center states is what they called it. Um, and you see that number really, it's gone down, but not a whole lot, not where it was at. And you look at those speeds, uh, crazy, crazy speeds. Um, 79 in December, over 150 miles an hour. That's crazy. Um, so you see that, you've seen these numbers. Uh, the crash fatalities, and I wanna point out with this, this is from the Governor's Traffic Safety Bureau, and it's by county, so we had 12 fatalities. That does not mean the number of crashes, mean the number of people died. 338 people lost their lives in 2022. Some of those crashes had multiple people in them. So that's not the amount of fatal crashes, it's the amount of people who died in crashes. So what they came up with is that 79 were speed related, crashes. Again, so 338 people and 114 were not wearing their seatbelt. This is our crash data from Dubuque and there's a lot more, we have a lot more of this. I wanna just kinda emphasize it quickly. Um, you can see where the crashes are in the city of Dubuque and where the concentration is on the left there. Um, the other one just shows the chart, um, just a trend since 2011 and 2013 where our crash is, has gone up. Um, we don't know why in 2021 they dropped down so much. We don't have a clue, actually. We can't, uh, we're trying to figure that one out, but they're on the rise again. And actually our enforcement is on the rise and we're still seeing accidents. So the, the correlation with that. Um, this is actually from the ICAT, which is um, Iowa State um, Traffic Center. They do a lot of the crash analysis. And so I just wanna show some of the roadways. This is Highway 20 in 2022 and then 2023 to date which was just last week. This is the concentration. What I'll point out there is Lower Dodge because that was one of the areas I emphasized. As you look on the right, that is Lower Dodge and that's where the concentration of the crashes are happening. This is all of Dubuque County on that. Here's another area I talked about, 15161, same time frame. This is just centering around essentially the downtown from the Wisconsin Bridge and you can see where those are starting to concentrate again. You can see Dodge Street kind of playing into that. Um, you know, there's a number of things that go with these ones. Um, get some of this. There's intersections that play into this, but as you know, downtown Dubuque, it's tight. There's a lot of um, buildings close to the intersections. Sometimes it's hard to see. Um, you add speed to that, and again, that reaction time and that time to stop slows down. It's harder to react because all of a sudden you have a car there. And so I wanna point that out as, an, as the issue. And again, if we design roadways to plan streets, that'd be great. Um, but again, I, I don't see us moving buildings back away from corners. Um, here's the rest of 151. This is going to just south, or this, actually I take it back. This is the fatals uh, or serious accidents in the 151 corridor in that time frame. Um, again, serious injury can really anything that's incapacitating um, or permanent. And so you can see where these are kind of at here. Um, and this one then is the Central Avenue, Highway 3. I want to point that out um, as being where this is just going farther north on, on the same streets. I point out traffic volumes because it, it's, we got a lot of traffic using the roadways. And this came from engineering. This was actually in 2021, I believe July, on these different streets. So you can look at the amount of traffic using a and this is one day um, using, using our roadways during that day. Um, so we got a lot of vehicles uh, on, on some of these areas and that's uh, vehicles and, and anything we can do to mitigate, um, like I said, those, those four main areas. Complaints, the city manager alluded to this. We get three formal requests per week for speed enforcement or speed shield placement. Now I'll talk about the speed shield. Speed shields, you see them, we put them on the signs, they tell you how fast you're going, right? That's, they're just data. They don't do anything else. So all we know is how fast somebody's going with that. We can record some data with it and we use that to determine, um, we put them particularly in neighborhoods. Um, 
But again, they, they just show speed. Um, that's it. Um, and so, you know, we, we always, you can see through our data, you always see like, here's the speed, the average speeds, and you'll see somebody that I think really just wants to see how fast they can make the sign read. And, it, and again, it's not generally we're not sitting there with that. The informal request, this I get a lot of. A lot of the informal request. Dodge Street's dangerous. Dodge Street's, a, that's when also been called a racetrack, a speedway. Um, Northwest Arterial is a racetrack. Um, when the lights, this one just came in this week. When the lights turn green at 17th, Central becomes a drag race uh, to get to the next light. Um, kids play in this neighborhood and one of them is going to get killed. I hear that one a lot uh, on, on neighborhoods kind of thing. And again, what I proposed in the, the memo is just areas that I knew of, know of, but there's also other areas that are just, um, as we talk about, um, you know, like, School zones, hear that one quite a bit. And that came up, particularly on our, our major roads like Pennsylvania or South Grandview at Bryant. Kids crossing the big wide street there and people not slowing down. So these are ones that come up um, quite frequently. Talked about this being a force multiplier. So it takes about 10 minutes for an officer to do a traffic stop, okay? Make the stop, make the thing, write the ticket, and issue the ticket. As we heard, it, it, it is, and I, having done traffic, and having been in law enforcement 30 years, you hear, you should have got that one. Did you get that one? Did you get that one? You know, we're not getting all those. It requires us to pick one and go. Um, I'm with that. Um, heavy traffic, it's, it's, we talked about safety. Heavy traffic congestion, okay? It's hard, for one, to get out on cars during that, weaving in and out. Even with lights and sirens, still dangerous. Um, think lower Dodge Street, there's no shoulder. There's nowhere to pull somebody over on that. Heavy congestion, now you got traffic trying to shove over into one lane that's heavy. Um, officers out there, the person you stopped is there. Um, and uh, it just, it becomes dangerous to do things in, in that area. Um, and again, as the city manager said, people, lack of a better word, gawk, and they look, and then boom, they crash again. That has happened frequently. Any officer can tell you that I've been on an accident where another accident's happened while they're sitting, and for no reason other than somebody wasn't paying attention on that. Um, like I said, not enough officers to cover it, and, and that's where it started. Uh, the other part of this is looking at that, what can we leverage with the technology to do um, with, with not enough officers to be there. You hear this, as soon as you left, it started right up again. Of course, the squad car's not there anymore. There's no flashing lights. Of course it happens again. Uh, you should have been here yesterday. You should have been here at two o'clock, not one o'clock. You should have been here, whatever. Play, that is pretty common because again, we're not sitting there all the time. Um, the placement and the locations where the traffic, like I said, difficult and dangerous. And I talked about lower dodge. There's other places with that. Um, but then it's equally enforcing. And again, I talked about that. It's, stop, it's essentially sighting, not stopping. It's sighting pretty much everybody, and it's not just one, and then, you know, I felt I got treated unfairly because I'm the one that got singled out and got stopped by the officer. Again, this is still going to happen because that's still, this does not replace that. So how do they work? So we talked, and that's the, the thing with this. There's still a process that needs to happen which isn't part of this. This is me proposing this idea. So there's fixed and mobile locations. And, I, and right after I'm done here, I'm gonna have uh, uh, Dorian Gruboff from um, GenOptic, who is a, is a vendor, but he's here just as a, to explain the technology so you understand the technology. We have not picked a vendor yet, which uh, we have not done any of that. We have not settled on anything, um, but he's here to explain the technology because I think that's important to understand. Because in 2012, when we looked at red light cameras, the technology wasn't there where it was. It wasn't challenged. It wasn't, uh, the backside wasn't there. It wasn't good. So, of course, that fell apart. Uh, but now it's a lot different. Um, so there's fixed and mobile locations. So there's fixed and then there's also mobile. Remember, um, we used to have a speed trailer that you'd put out and has signs. Some, um, you see them out in the county. I think they have one and it'll show your speed. You can mobile move it around. There's actually a version that has the, the, the mobile um, um, speed camera on it, so you're able to do that. So you can move it to areas um, to do that. But part of that is the complete public transparency. If you see other places that have the mobile ones, this is going to be this place on this day and this time. They, they put it out. We don't, we're not gonna hide it again. If you voluntarily slow down, great, no problem. Uh, it's a civil violation, as you alluded to. The, the thing with that is there is, no, 
it doesn't count against your driving record. And we talk about some, some equity components there. Um, three moving violations in the state of Iowa, uh, within a 12 month period, you lose your driver's license. This doesn't count on that. Um, and it, and other, it doesn't count against insurance is uh, the other part of that. Um, insurance companies don't know that it happened, quite honestly. Um, there is fines. There is fines with that. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the fines are, are, are set. Uh, there's appeal processes that go with that. If you look at some of the ordinances that are out there, I mean, they got, what happened with, um, get to, I'll get to that in a minute, actually. I'll cover that in a minute. But there's an appeal process. And then the crash severity reduction. Again, it's about severity, and not necessarily reducing crash, but reducing the severity of them. Uh, the fixed and mo mobile locations, the collaborative placement based upon, and collaborative, I mean by that, engineering, traffic planners, all the people coming together and saying, these are the best spots we need to do this for one reason or, or another. You know, if there's a roadway, we need to have something because of roadway design. Do we need to have something because of the complaints that are coming in on this? Um, and then obviously using our data and our traffic studies with that. The complete public transparency. I can't emphasize that enough because that's the point of this. The point is to voluntarily change a driver behavior. So publicized locations, warning periods, signage, year end report that spells out everything that has happened with it. And part of that is reviewing our data to see if it is effective. Can we see that, see a reduction in what, what's going on there? Uh, we have a baseline. But again, there, there's a lot of nuances with that and that's the caution with it. But are we seeing some of that? Are we seeing that, yeah, we didn't issue any citations here. So obviously it's working. There's things here. Do we move it, re remove it, or move it? No. The civil violation, I talked about this a little bit. Does not go on the driving record or affect insurance. It goes to the registered owner. We talked about that, what the, be the benefit or the negative of that is. Um, I use an example of that. And, and some people say it shouldn't go to the registered owner. Uh, my daughter got one. She called me. It's my car. She said, I got one of these. What do you want to do about it? I said, pay it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> plain and simple. You need to pay it. It ain't, it ain't mine. And, you know. Um, so that's how, that's how I uh, base that upon. Um, can you be contested? Uh, various options, depends on what ordinance and how we write the ordinance, but there's options to contest it, and the city manager gave that option to the diversion, which is uh, a great way to it. Now, I will say the unpaid fines go to collection and Iowa offset program. I will, do want to cover that quickly because that was part of one of the, you know, this has been challenged in state and federal court, these systems have already, and upheld, but with some caveats. So. The collections, it has to go through the court. So we can't just do a go to collection. If you don't pay your fine, because that's what happened. What happens if they don't pay it? We're not going to send it collections. It has to go through the court. That's the municipal infraction part of that. You go to court, and the court can order collections. And the Iowa offset program, which is where it sets against your um, tax return and things like that, where they'll withhold that kind of stuff, or casino winnings, that kind of thing. Um, but it does not. We're not sending it automatic to collections. It's through the option of somebody using the court system and the court orders the collection side of that. Here's some of the civil fines. We kind of talked about them. Uh, I did reach out to Waterloo today and I don't know if that's totally updated. Um, I asked for them to update that. But Des Moines, is, you can see how they do theirs. Um, Cedar Rapids has it set for one to five over and all the way through um, and they actually address construction zones. So, and there's, uh, the one thing I, you, know, you ask what one to five seems a little bit less, um, generally where I see that being used is school zones. You know, where it's just, where there's a lot of kids crossing the street and five miles an hour can change, make an impact. I'm not recommending that or saying that, I'm just saying this is something that it can be used for. And the construction zones, I want to point that out because our officers when they ran the Northwest Arterial this summer working traffic in that construction zone that was out there, they said they could not turn around fast enough on, on the speeders that were going through there in the construction zone, which we know exponentially creates dangerous problems. This is the state of Iowa speeding, scheduled speeding fines. This is what happens if an officer stops a person. This is the fines that, that get associated with that, um, as you can see. Um, one to five over 89, 50, six to 10, 118, 25, and then it just goes up and then um, goes up quite a bit. So that, that's the difference in the two. There's actually more fine here. 
than there is in the civil, civil side. So here's some of the appeal processes, because I know this is important. Um, Waterloo, as within 30 days, can challenge in writing. Um, officer review for a decision, or within 30 days can request a municipal infraction for a court date. And then you can hear it in court. Cedar Rapids, pretty much the same thing. Um, Council Bluffs had a little bit different. They threw out that within 30 days you can challenge in writing and the city attorney reviewed the decision. So a little bit different on that. But as far as I could tell, they did not have the municipal infraction um, option with that. Um, actually, let me point out, one thing that Council Bluff, their city attorney said, the whole point is, I just want people not to do it. That's it. So I, I don't care about the fine. I care about that they just don't do it again. So that was part of the city attorney decision. Um, crash severity reduction. So this doesn't show up in the Cedar Rapids study for the year. Why? Because they didn't have any. This is over a period of time. And, and Chief German, um, ironically, worked in the, on the east coast where there's a lot of these and implemented in a big county in the Maryland area um, back when he was there. And he, he said this, these are truly do work. Like you said, they went from these 10 fatal or five fatalities a year to zero. And the one that the city manager alluded to was actually not speed related. That happened. Um, National Traffic Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, you know, automated speed enforcement is an effective countermeasure to reduce speeding related crashes, fatals, and injuries. Um, and then again, they said the same thing, the lack of state level automated speed enforcement enabling legislation and restrictions on the use in states where legislation exists have led to underuse of this effective speeding countermeasure. Again, the point is we're asking for people to voluntarily not do this. The next steps, we're not jumping into this. There has to be an ordinance passed first. We have to develop that. Then we need to start looking for requests for proposals for vendors. We need to review the data for placement and see where that needs to go. Um, DOT approvals, pretty simple approval process, but it still needs appro approval. We just need to uh, do that. Um, public awareness, campaign, here's what's gonna happen. Here's where it's gonna be. Here's how long it's gonna be in warning. I just saw the city of Hudson just this week said, our warning period is over, it's starting. Um, and then we, we're gonna continue to monitor the legislation. You know, every year there's something in legislation about this. Um, but in the last couple of years, we haven't really seen anything that really has effectively changed the use of them, more so just that those little tweaks, you know, about the backside of, of, you know, how the appeal process goes and things like that. Now, I have uh, Dorian uh, Grubaw here from GenOptic. Uh, he's gonna come up and he's gonna give you the technology side of how these things work. Good evening, I'm Dorian Grubal I'm with uh, Genoptic. Um, about me, uh, before getting into the smart mobility or uh, traffic safety industry, I was a police officer for 20 years and retired in 2012 and was recruited into this field kind of naturally because I spent half of it in uh, the traffic division. So, um, oops, that didn't do it. Oh, that's easier. Okay, I will, I don't have a long presentation. I will try to get through this part. A lot of this is uh, about questions and what questions might come up. Um, I don't know the procedure here, but if you have any, I'm happy to answer them as we go so you don't have to wait or, or at the end. Well, actually, we find that it's easier to let you finish the presentation, okay. then we'll jump in. We'll write them down here. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, so again, I'm with uh, Genoptic. Uh, Genoptic is a international company that has three different divisions from automotive to the biggest division are optics and photonics. We always add this in here. We, we have the NASA contract. We've done all the optics and photonics on the uh, Mars rover. So all the pictures you see from Mars came from equipment developed by Genoptic. So I mean, we're able to capture images and do things off planet. We're, we've been doing them very well on planet as well. Um, uh, moving 
further what we're talking about tonight uh, is the smart mobility division. Um, what you're talking about with speed cameras is a smart mobility um, enforcement process, uh, part of a, what you would call a Vision Zero campaign, the enforcement and, uh, leg of the education enforcement and um, engineering, everything going together uh, to reduce speed. So as I've heard things here tonight, which I, which I think are great, I think it's important to point out that the, the purpose of this program that you're considering is to reduce the amount of cars speeding on your roadways. The goal would be to reduce speeding by approximately 50% in the first year. That would be the goal, to reduce your accidents. It's been proven to do so. So the, the object here is not to, which is misgiven, is, is not to come in and see how much money can be made. Uh, the business model is to see if we can't cut how much money is being produced by the program so that we know that safety is happening and all that can be delivered through um, numbers and data collected. Um, just to give a little bit about us so that you know who you're talking to, we, we are an international company. Um, we have six regional units across uh, the world. I represent the Americas, uh, so North America, South America, the Caribbean. Um, our United States or our North America or our Americas division is out of uh, Jupiter, Florida. Uh, there's over 4,300 employees worldwide. We've been around uh, since the turn of the century. We've been doing speed and red light enforcement uh, since the 60s uh, in Europe. So since the inception and development of this type of techn technology, uh, Unoptic's been a part of it. Um, we have in America over, just in the US alone, over 3,000 sites. So of our 30 plus thousand sites, over 3,000 are in the United States. <coughs> our system here, and I, I don't always, but I figured I'd bring it out because a lot of times um, it's always talk of the cameras and they're watching you and everything. So I thought I'd bring the, the defendant, so to speak. And that's, that's what we'll be talking about right there. That is a, a Vector SR camera. I mean, other vendors will have different versions of this, but it's just a piece of equipment that, that law enforcement uses, the force multiplier. It's just a tool belt, a tool in their tool belt. It's just something that could be utilized, and it's just an object. It's it's only watching. It's not watching people. It is watching a section of roadway, and that's all it's watching. Um, our camera happens to be able to do multiple things. So you'll see up here multiple things. Out of that one camera, you could do red light enforcement. We put school zone safety, but any type of spot speed enforcement, you could do point to point enforcement. Um, it does have ANPR and ALPR on board. I'll get into that a little bit here in, a, in, in just a, a bit on the ANPR side, which is automatic number plate recognition versus automatic license plate recognition. I'll, I'll go over that. And then DVR recorded uh, video, 24-7 monitoring. Um, so as I was saying, these cameras are built to watch a section of roadway or an intersection depending on what you're talking about. Today we're talking about speed. So a section of roadway, approximately 100 meters, so just over 300 feet of roadway. Uh, this camera in particular, uh, three lanes at a time. Bigger cameras, you get more lanes. Um, but what it's doing is monitoring every moving object in that field of vision across that 100 meters or so. So as we were talking before, police officer pulls out, gets one car, why didn't you pull the others over? Well, I could only pull one over. Uh, this camera can write every single car within that 100 meter view across those lanes, whether it's 30 cars at a time or 176 cars. It has all of them. Um, it does not take a break. It is there for as long as it's left there. Um, with that said, it is absolutely not a replacement for law enforcement or traffic enforcement. It is only an aid. Um, that's why in, in most laws it's written in. If an officer gives a subject a ticket that the camera also caught, the officer ticket is the one that gets processed and the camera ticket goes away. And that's there because traditional law enforcement and traffic enforcement with police is never meant to go away, not ever. Um, this just lightens the load and provides 24-7 enforcement. With that, 
is really, basically, how you reduce your numbers. People know that the cameras are there through the signage, through the news reports, inevitably, through all the public awareness, and people will slow down. And as your program progresses or as you, long, have, as you have it long enough, people stop trying to track where are the cameras so I just don't have to speed here. They just start driving more hyper-focused like they were when they were 16, and they're trying to obey every single rule. And that's what you're trying to get, is more compliance and people paying better attention as they're driving. I'll play this short little stint. This video is going to be a visual. Um, maybe. It's going to show you kind of how this works now. This, of course, came from our European friends. So as we're watching it, it's also for average speed or point-to-point -point speed. So you'll see the cameras, and all I would say is in the enforcement you're looking at here, just imagine the cameras turned around looking at the back of the car, not the front of the car. Um, in this, they're scanning them before they enter the zone. And as they move through, they would get to the second set of cameras, but that's determining average speed over a section of roadway, which we do a lot in Europe and is possible. But for here, Spot, it's recognizing all these cars and it's grabbing and uh, holding the plates of the ones that are in uh, violation, whichever has been set by the community or the, the police department. And it's doing that across all those lanes um, simultaneously for every car that comes by. Here is a, an example of sort of inside the camera what's going on. I said ANPR and ALPR and that sometimes gets jumbled. ALPR is where it's scanning every plate and it can send alerts to police for one of vehicles or whatever. Our cameras use what's called ANPR. Um, it has ALPR as well. Not everyone wants to use that. It's a function that you just don't have to use or it doesn't have to come with the camera. But our cameras do use ANPR, or number plate recognition, so it's actually reading the camera itself and the artificial intelligence on board are identifying the vehicle and reading the plate as the car is going by as it's getting, say, a violation. So if the, if the car comes up as a violation or speeding over the threshold set, the camera has read the plate and identified the car and auto-processed that through the NLET system, um, basically the BMV, and put it into a ticket format and automatically send it on to the police for review. We also use, um, I don't know if you can see it that far back, but it looks like there's a lot of little lenses in here, and that's all IR flash. We also use an ex external IR flashes depending on the, the darkness of the roadway. This video is actually specifically set up in an area where there were no lights whatsoever, and we didn't even add any external IR flash to it, just the 16 nodes that were in the camera, and we're still able to pick up um, the vehicle and the license plate without any exterior flash. I bring that up only because uh, as the industry is trying to get away from the, the white flash that you see, which is also a distraction on the roadway, we do not use white flash in any of our systems anywhere in the world. Um, deep learning, artificial intelligence, talk about artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. Um, we have a very large AI engine that we've been developing for decades. Um, what is it basically? Basically, it's if you could take a human brain and put it in a machine to not just do what you're asking it to do, but learn as you go. And by that, I mean, uh, we've all seen license plates. They might change, um, different things like that. Well, the artificial intelligence engine on board can actually see the new plate a few times and understand what it's looking at and then process it that way. Uh, it's also what is powering it to um, learn different things. Uh, like an example would be as we program the camera in, say, a school zone to only operate for certain hours. Well, the AI engine on board is, is recognizing uh, past just what we program it in, it's actually 
monitoring that. So if anything were to go wrong, the camera would recognize uh, certain scenarios um, and know there was an issue. Um, this is also more used on our civil security platform when we're talking about LPR. We're developing some things for Homeland Security, and that's when this really gets uh, kind of technical. Um, I won't bore you with that this evening. Um, but that engine on board is what's able to uh, read plates and recognize vehicles and process them automatically so that the timeline, instead of being what used to be in the beginning of the industry, might be a couple of weeks before you can even get a ticket in the mail. That's why most laws say that you need to have that mailed out within 30 days of the instance. Um, we try to cut that process by um, the system recognizing the plate, auto-processing the plate, putting it into the format for a law enforcement officer review. Once that review has happened, if the officer has deemed um, an event to have happened and uh, needs to issue the ticket, they will approve that, which will put the officer's signature and badge number on the ticket, and then it will be mailed to the registered owner the very next day. Uh, these are some examples of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence versus conventional, and I know it says ALPR, you could say ANPR, just the way computers are reading things. Um, conventional technology looks at a letter or a number and it goes almost like you're clicking a, a typewriter. Artificial intelligence and machine learning scans the entire thing. It's, uh, if you've watched movies, you know, you'll see sometimes you know, a laser light going over something that's able to scan and read that and it's neat in the movie, but essentially that's what's happening here. It's scanning the entire plate and it's seen so many things that whether it's covered or rusted out or, or whatnot, uh, in 99 plus percent of the case, it has identified the plate number. Uh, if there is some question, it would kick over to a human for review. When we talk about these installations, uh, nowadays there's many different ways, fixed or mobile. So you can put cameras on, you can either put in your, we can put in poles, we can go off of any existing street furniture to include uh, light poles, school zone poles, telephone poles, highway gantries, and whatnot, or we can install our own pole and uh, put cameras on that. On top of that are mobile solutions. So the mobile solution we use is a solar-based portable trailer, like the, like the speed trailers that the chief was talking about earlier. They're actually basically on the same trailer platform. We have a solar panel on there that's charging uh, some batteries in the box. And that trailer can be set out, and it was built to be able to set out and not need any maintenance or checking of the batteries for anywhere from eight to 12 months. Uh, unlike other trailers in the industry. Um, on top of the mass that you see there is a camera. Um, one trailer can have a couple cameras facing each direction and, and cover an entire four to six lane roadway. We also generally will put speed signs on them, the same flashing speed signs, so that uh, you know they'll flash when you're over whatever the set amount is that the city would want so that the driver not only has seen a sign saying that you're photo enforcing in an area maybe, but they're also seeing the sign flashing at them as they're coming up before they're on camera, before they're going to be in the zone where the camera is, trying to get them to slow down before they're even there. Again, the goal is to get people to slow down. Um, so these can be put up or taken down in 30 minutes or less, so they're very mobile uh, and can be uh, moved in within a couple hours to a new location. Uh, your program, or any program, any photo enforcement program, and the one specifically in Iowa work this way, from start to finish, you know, the company that is going to come in is going to provide you the equipment, they're going to put the equipment up, they're going to maintain the equipment, they're going to make sure the calibration is accurate, the daily testing, they're going to bring in the infractions, pass them off to the police, they're going to mail them for the city, collect the fines, and they're going to do a lot of back office work. So you have to have a, a very good back office, which we've had a back office, uh, as they call it, the back office facility or BOF, um, over 20 years, been refined, and we have our own development teams, we do at least in the United States, that can uh, customize this per community. So if there's something that needs to be developed 
different as far as reporting or what's going on in the back end for a community, uh, depending on the type of reports they need. It's easily done. But through this system, quick and efficient evaluation of not just the incidents, but then there's also, as the chief was talking about, transparency of program. Um, finance can look up what's going on with different tickets that are out there. The police can look up how many tickets have been issued, how many, um, they could do that by month, by day. Uh, and you can print reports. So they, they'll be able to access reports. I know you put in there an annual report, but the, the, the police department should be able to report they could do it on a daily basis if you wanted them to, but weekly, quarterly, by simply clicking in the time frame they want, and the system will give back how many tickets have been issued, how many vehicles have passed, and things of that nature. I say this with uh, the warning program that was discussed earlier, and that's the baseline. So any program that goes in, you would have a 30-day warning period where Warnings are mailed out, not tickets for money. Just another thing to get uh, the public used to the cameras. Um, that'll be your baseline. That's the baseline of what the problem is before the program starts. Three months in, six months in, nine months in, 12 months in. You'll be able to go and not just see, well, we only wrote this many tickets this month versus this many tickets last month. But six months ago, this is how many cars went past this camera during that time frame. And this month, this is how many cars went past. So it actually breaks it down further and gives you a percentage. We've reduced speeding by this percentage because the traffic's the same and the speeding problem is less. Um, the chief was talking about COVID and yes, I worked for a different company then, um, but um, I was shocked to see that uh, everyone in the industry was saying, well, we should have a lot less tickets coming up. No one's on the roadways. And the traffic was significantly less, but I will tell you the amount of tickets written were much more. <laughs> okay, um, we're maintaining and managing all the data from the program, so everything, and I, I, I do mean everything. If somebody mails in with their ticket a letter, that is kept photographed and, and kept in a file. When somebody receives a notice, they'll be able to go to a site and view the same evidence that the police looked at. So the same photographs, the same video, whatever it is, they will see the exact same thing and it'll be available to them. All the records that are for each of those cases will be available to that person. I mean, not the public, but that person that was issued the ticket, same information the police has, the same information the city has. Everyone has the same information. Processing flow I discussed a little bit. And this is where I talk about um, the process getting much better and uh, especially with, with use, usage of the ANPR technology. You have an event that happens today and it used to be that over the next week it would be processed by a human being, sent to the police, given another five to seven days to, for them to process and get it mailed out in this weekly process. An event captured today by one of our cameras would be auto-processed today by one of our cameras and put into the system for law enforcement to check off within a day. Once they've reviewed it, the minute they accept, if they accept, if they reject, the ticket is rejected. It's, it's, they've put reason for rejection and it's gone. If they accept it, the very next day it's mailed out. So. With no hiccups, that process could be three days before a ticket's in the mail, um, which in the industries, I know it's not immediate, but it's very quick. Um, these are, again, as the chief mentioned, civil violations, so they're more like a parking ticket. Uh, but where you get the enforcement benefit is what I talked about before, the signage and just having them out there and people knowing that they're there. Um, and especially if you have mobile prep platforms that you're moving, even when you're updating that daily. Um, people in most of the cities I've ever worked or seen, the reason that comes down is people just decide when they're in those communities they're just going to drive a little bit more cautious. This is an example of a ticket. Uh, it doesn't matter. These don't vary company to company. It's pretty standard. 
not just in the state of Iowa, but across the United States, all the notices of liability look pretty much the same. There is a continuity uh, in the industry uh, and a standard um, way of doing things. Back office also with financial reports, statistics, payment portals. The payment portal is what I talked about. That's where uh, citizens would go and they'd be able to review your ordinance. They would be able to see what the evidence that was collected or the ticket. They have a copy of it. They'd also be able to see the pictures uh, online. They would be able to request a hearing date if they wanted. They would be able to pay the fine and they would be able to see any type of correspondence that's gone out. So if they didn't answer the first notice, and they got a second notice and they were wondering, well, this couldn't have been sent out. They would see that it was, they would see when, they would see all of that there. Everything, again, is very transparent. Um, reporting of every instance in the program from ticket issuance to payments to statistics afterwards to uh, a court hearing manager, because in most, most municipalities in Iowa, usually there is kind of a mediation hearing first with the individual. Uh, again, these programs are not to take the human out of the process. So if somebody has some mediating you know, circumstances, A, they can go to the police directly. I was rushing to the hospital. I was whatever the instance is. And law enforcement has the last say. If they say, okay, we would not have issued a ticket here, they can cancel that ticket out. If it gets to the mediation hearing, the mediation person would be able to mediate that with the person, and if that does not, uh, both parties can't agree, then it moves on to municipal court, as the chief was saying. So in these programs that you're looking at, what you should be looking for is turnkey. Pretty much 98, 99% of everything provided by the vendor, which is what we do, the police department's providing the manpower because the law enforcement officer does have to review. Um, and this is a partnership. This is not a company coming in saying, this is how many cameras we think you should have. This is where we think they should go. It's actually the reverse. We come in and work in partnership with law enforcement and engineering and ask, where are your problems at? These tickets cannot produce revenue. They can't just produce revenue from a roadway. You have to have a problem there. The only revenue comes because tickets are issued. Tickets are only issued because somebody's going a certain miles an hour, certain mile per hour over the speed limit that law enforcement has set. So the companies like ours, we, we especially do not set anything. We're coming to work for the municipality. The only input we put in is if you have a location, our engineers might say, well, we can't put a camera right there. We can put it 15 feet this way something of that nature. Uh, whatever the threshold is, is picked by the municipality. Whatever the fines are, picked by the municipality. And again, I'll reiterate, this program should be completely free. No money should be, no checks should be written to us or any vendor from this program. These are violator funded programs. Our percentage that the city manager talked about is on paid fines. And that's, that's, that's where we get the revenue to be able to supply all of this, where we don't need anyone to write a check. So I know I kind of rushed through that. I don't, you know, this has been a long evening for you. I wanted to just get you some general information. And usually it's not what I'm presenting. There's usually a lot of questions, and I'm happy to answer any of those for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chief, do you have anything else to add no, before we discuss? Here for questions. OK. All right. Questions and discussion? Mr. Sprank. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, so when a, f I kind of asked this question, I uh, didn't quite, maybe you can answer it yet. When a fatal crash happens, what's, what type of manpower are you looking at and like how much time does that take for your staff? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question because it's, so I, my background is also accident investigation. Now so it's also the city managers, ironically. So, um, but this is, uh, it takes, so give an example. So we uh, had a semi tip over on the South Mix Master, which is where 151, 61 come together, um, scattered out a pretty lengthy period to do it traditionally on that. So now we have a road closure of a major roadway because we have to measure that um, 
may, we need to set up a baseline. So we need a couple officers just to do it. We need to take photographs. We need to take a, a baseline, do measurements. Um, you're talking multi, multi hours. That's just two officers working that, possibly three, probably to speed that up. And then the road closures, depending on how big the road is and where the detours need to be. So you're taking more officers into that. So it could be just a road closure, easy one, or it could be multiple locations because now we need to detour up and we got to let people know where to turn off because we just put them into a residential area and things like that. So it could be a lot of officers in over multi-hours. Again, where does that affect? That affects, it simply affects commerce for one because tra traffic can't move through there. We closed it down and now it slows that down. Um, changing a traffic pattern can increase accidents on that. Uh, again, our staffing that goes into that. Now, there, do we leverage technology? We have ability with some drone stuff with the state patrol to do that a little quicker. Um, but it still takes staffing and this still is an impact to the, the roadway and the motoring public with that. Did have one more for, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. for Dorian. Um, okay, so I get the business model, reduce speed. I like that. Um, say theoretically in five years, you're not issuing any tickets, then what do you do with the things? You just leave them up there? Do you like be like, you wanna void your contract with us? What would happen then? So if, if that's the ultimate goal is to reduce speeding and all of a sudden it turns into you're not issuing any citations, then what happens? Because you have all this data. Uh, so. I, I totally get the question, I've gotten it before and <laughs> It's a hard one to answer because I've never seen it happen. Okay. And that's only because, un you know, unfortunately, until, until such time as the, the technology has gotten until the cars really are driving yourself and it's set at a speed, um, and therefore there is no speeding, the utopia of no one going over or driving aggressively is just hasn't happened. Um, always, somebody's always going to be in a rush. The volume going down, so more so to say, you know, the volume, is there a volume and a revenue number that gets to a certain point where we go, oh, we're not making enough? No. No. So even if it was just a trickle and we really had gained the success, no, we would actually want our cameras to stay. Uh, most likely in what we've seen, they've already been paid for um, through the program. So we would want them to stay because it's gaining your compliance. I have seen them go down. If you take that Cedar Rapids study, which I'm well very familiar with and have worked with them, um, during that almost two year period where they quote unquote turned the cameras off because they weren't enforcing, the cameras weren't off, they were still running, they just weren't enforcing. And speed within seven days went up 30%. Because hmm. so people thought the cameras weren't gonna write them tickets. So, no, we would not want to pull the cameras from you. Thank you. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Well, I had a giant list of questions, and those, those presentations really answered a lot of them. But I still have a list of questions, so I'll just start with a couple. <clears throat> I, I think, uh, Dorian, it was you that said our goal is to reduce um, speeding by 50 percent do we have a goal and is that it I mean I always like to know okay what what are we trying to achieve so that we can see if we're effective um, and can there's, you clarify there's a lot of variations that go it depends on the roadways you're looking at uh, a lot of times it's the transient traffic coming through so if you have a roadway where different people are coming through every single day. It's harder to gain compliance with somebody when they only come through once. So you'll have that, that residual number. Uh, when I say 50% it's because we're shooting fairly high, fairly quick. You know, the averages are that a speed program can start reducing your speed anywhere from maybe 15, or, let's be better, 20% to up to maybe 70% in the first year, the first two years. We're really shooting at uh, Genoptic for 50% in less than 12 months is what we're hoping uh, is the outcome. We're shooting for big results, and we do that with the, the work and the cooperation we do with the municipality to make sure that the program, it's not, the other thing it's not about is it's not about how many cameras you can put up. It's not about putting 45 cameras up because you can. It's how do we put the cameras up. It's almost like 
when you think about security, where can we put things to get the best value or the best, the best thing that we're trying to achieve? And the same thing in speed enforcement. Where can we put these in our, our problem hotspots um, that will gain that compliance and then maybe utilize some other measures around to gain more compliance? But it's, you know, traffic safety starts on those main roads that they go for, and then with the trailers, you can move some around and you're gaining just as much compliance without having to inundate a community with dozens and dozens or hundreds of cameras. Okay. Well, then a related question to um, Chief Jensen, then in your next steps, could you add to that a reporting process so that you would be coming back to us saying, you know, this is how the cameras are doing? Oh, absolutely. Like I said, I put the year-end report because that's what I've seen. But uh, again, if we have the the ability and, and we can pull it monthly or quarterly or whatever, that would be uh, another way we can do that. And for sure, that's, like I said, I, I'm all about the complete transparency of it. I, and I'm all about the results of it, if we're seeing that. And so we can all see if there's actually results coming from this. Okay, I'll, I'll wait to see what other people have questions. And Sounds good, thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Farber. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, thank you. And uh, Jeremy and Dorian, thank you for your uh, presentations. Um, I do have to let you know that I have a small business here in Dubuque that is at the corner of an interse intersection of two major streets, University and Delhi. And we consider ourselves at the restaurant basically the poster child for speeding enforcement. And there doesn't go a day without a close encounter um, or injury or potential accident or crashes. Over eight years, we have seen them almost monthly. So we are so appreciative of the opportunity to um, have some kind of speed enforcement uh, that will not only save lives or just make it more safe for the neighborhood residents and for the patrons. So I just wanted to share that with you because I see it and walk through it almost every day. So that being said, um, I wanted to thank everyone that sent us emails and everybody here tonight that gave us conversation and comments that kind of help provide some of the questions. Um, and I think a lot of those have been answered tonight. But behalf, on behalf of those groups, I was wondering, is there an opportunity on your list, Jeremy, to create an advisory committee um, of some of these local merchants, some of these local businessmen, some of the um, interested residents maybe to um, have a collaborative uh, partnership as you're determining some of those parameters for the uh, system and the solution that might be created by someone like Dorian. And I think that's absolutely what we're looking for is public input into that, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like I said, one of the areas is complaints and that's, that comes from the public input, sure, sure. you know, and for sure. So I think there's opportunity to be able to look at that and, and okay. review again. I, I caution that it has to be people understand because we you know we talk about the emotional side of that sure you know we don't want that to we really want to use what what is out there but yeah i, I think that absolutely there's I mean, an even just an open house or a forum might be of interest yeah. um, and i did want to let you know that i did some research today at the insurance institute of highway safety uh, which is kind of like the ntsb but only for insurance providers that actually does some of the same research um, and it was pretty much in parallel, Jeremy, I think, with what you had mentioned in terms of the decrease in percentage of crashes um, and just the overall awareness when those campaigns are out, those marketing campaigns are out, that makes um, more of the drivers accountable um, based upon their research. So I just wanted to share that with you as well. And they also had a, a comment about a, a constituency advisory commission uh, set up of local um, businesses and, and, and residents to assist. So I, I just, I appreciated the fact that when I did that research, and this is 2020 data, uh, that it included some of the same points that you had made. So um, again, thank you for that, and, and I'll look forward to hearing more and about more next steps as well. Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I have questions, and I'll save my comments for later. First of all, uh, Mr. Gruba and Chief, you know, your presentations weren't in our packet today. Is um, I'm, unless I have an old, like I have had an old uh, agenda. Does everybody else have their presentations? No. Okay, because so we weren't able to look at them and and formulate questions with all the. I mean, look how long we've gone, and they went as fast as they could. So this is an enormous topic. 
now my questions. You know, you you talked about crash data, and I saw the maps. Uh, do we uh, talk about personal injury versus property damage in those crashes? So you can you can uh, okay, you can uh, take can, that out. I can get that info. Yep. Oh, why don't we have speed shields, if that's what you call those, like going down Dodge, and it says how fast it is uh, right now. I don't know how many speed shields we want, but I think uh, your idea that maybe some teenagers want to see a big number. I tell you what, when I appreciate those speed shields, because unlike what you said before, speeding is a choice. I don't think so. Not sometimes. It just happens. You're driving. Things, things are happening on the road, right? Somebody's coming over. Here comes the ramp. You know, I got to move over. Can't, I can't move. It's a difficult task sometimes to drive. So I don't think speeding is always a choice. It does happen in trying to get, in try to navigate our roads. So why don't we have more speed shields up to help people know their speed and slow down? They're basic technology. They're radar related, and radar is not going to pick up. Have you seen it when you've seen multiple cars and it's bouncing back and forth and you don't know which car is going that fast? That's because of the radar technology. So you'll see it, it might be getting the car going away. It might be getting the one on two-way streets. On those bigger streets, you can't cover all the lanes with that technology. So, so is this camera going to be able to, you know, these speed cameras, they're going to be able to show us early what your speed, what the speed is on those shields. So we're coming down the street and there's cameras up there about a block, about a half block away, we're going to know, you know, we've got your speed or not. Yeah, I, and I wouldn't, Dodge would not be a portable location because of that. Um, but again, Dory can talk to the technology of that. Um, but the speed shields we have are just rudimentary Single radar, lane. yeah, radar Single technology. Lane. Well, they'll pick up too, but you see it'll go going and coming when you see that, and you see it bouncing back and forth. And it's like you're looking at what's my speed, what's their speed, is that right, which right. one's going? So it, there are, yeah. So quick question: I'm sure you're familiar with what's going on in the state, and you know, last year they had a lot of talk, and it got out of committee. These uh, automated traffic cameras, center file 2352. And it, uh, it talked about local authorities have to uh, retain the data and utilize alternative measures prior to the implementation of an ATE system. Do we have a plan for alternate measures? I guess I'd, my question would be, what is that? Why? I, I'm asking yeah, you, you're I the expert. Yeah, I don't know what the legislative tried to, to identify as alternate measures, because in my world, alternate measures is police officers okay. uh, on that. And then there's also the speed shields. Traffic cat, it, yeah. calming things. Yeah, that calming you can things. Do. That's an engineering thing. Um, yeah, there's <laughs> different things with that. So again, I, without knowing what they're actually, I'm just reading what it yeah. says. No, I'm just, I'm just curious what the defining of that was. It says prior to implementing any system, and the specific location uh, uh, has to have data that establishes the need. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means either, but they. They want that done before putting it in the cameras. In the specific location that it's used, implement at least one alternative measure that could improve safety for at least six months prior to the implementation of an ATE system. Now, that didn't, uh, did not become law, uh, but you know people are thinking about it, and we've had to change drastically what we've done because of the state. Now, are you familiar with this, uh, what's going on in the state? Yeah, that's part of what we're watching was the legislative side. So, and that's part of why I put that in there. We're watching what's going on with that. Like I said, uh, it's been challenged. It hasn't come out yet. There's been just minor tweaks to the systems. Um, and so, you know, the big challenges it seems like have passed and then this legislative legislation gets introduced every year. And so far we haven't seen anything with that. Uh, thank you for your help, Mr. Mayor. I'm done that now, for now. Ms. Weather. So I agree that many of my questions um, that were voiced to me by constituents have been answered. And so thank you for your presentation. Um, a couple more um, contract related questions, I think, for you, sir. Oh, that's um, how long is the average contract that a municipality has with you? Uh, standard contract, and this is industry-wide, is an initial term of five years, and then usually it's just a rollover um, automatic one-year renewal unless the municipality just decides to terminate with 60 days notice. What would happen if there would be some sort of a statewide legislative change that would not allow us to keep our contract with you? There's language in every 
at least in ours, that address all of that. If anything makes the program uh, no longer legal in the state, then we just come pack the equipment up. Okay. It is not on the city at all. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and do you as a vendor traditionally have a requirement for municipalities um, for a minimal enforcement line? So uh, I had looked at Cedar Rapids um, numbers more specifically, noting, of course, and I appreciate your comments on the school zone areas that a one to five over the speed limit does make a difference when you're asking drivers to slow down in those areas. But um, do you as a vendor require a specific number that you must start at in order for enforcement? No, no, we don't. Okay. We don't. And I've never actually seen a program, and this includes Cedar Rapids that cites anyone below five miles an hour, but what they're doing in their ordinance is not telling you what they're gonna enforce at and showing you a fine schedule all the way down. I actually don't believe they enforce for less than 10 anywhere. Um, and I have never seen any program in the United States enforce less than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit except in a school zone. And the lowest I've seen in a school zone was six, but most go, if they're going to go below that 10, go to eight. And for most of the reasons there from doing the program so long is that, um, you know, the statistic, that, you know, when they're in school zones for children and they're running in that 20 mile an hour zone, a lot of people ask, why is it 20? It's such a low speed. And it's basically from, I think it's the American Medical Association, but the, the study done on if a child is struck in a school zone at 20, they do have a 95% chance of surviving the incident. If you raise that to 40, they have a 5% chance so it's in that 20 mile an hour range. So they're really trying to keep you down under 30. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen some dip below that to enforce, but I would say that the general speed camera program in the United States starts enforcement at 10 or above. Okay. okay. And one last question. Of the municipalities that your company serves, um, what is the smallest municipality? <laughs> Hazleton, Iowa. <laughs> And what's the population? I, I think it's less than 300. It might be 200. Really? It's not a lot. Do they have law enforcement officers there? No. The, the okay. sheriff's department has to administer the program for them. Okay. Um, they just want it to be safe. As a matter of fact, they've given the sheriff's department uh, most of their percentage. We, I mean, we took the, our 35, and then they, so they had 65 left. And I know they gave a high percentage to the sheriff's office to monitor it because they just want people to slow down. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Spring. Yeah, a couple more follow-up questions. So, uh, Dorian, these are very advanced cameras. Clearly, there's one on another planet. Um, you didn't show any pictures of what happens when it's snowy or rainy. Is the I'm assuming the the computers or the AI system can still see something when it's in bad weather. Yeah. Yes, we've. It, it's actually. It, I mean, okay, you're not going to get people speeding in a hurricane or a blizzard, but if you did, the camera would catch it. It's IP65 rated, so the elements don't enforce it. We utilize our camera systems in um, <laughs> northern Canada, so really cold, and um, in the Middle East, so, I mean, 140 plus degree temperatures. So, yes, the, the, the elements won't, fortunately, the elements, uh, a lot of people, you know, when it gets really snowy like that, really rainy, um, I think people do start driving actually the way that the program's actually trying to get them to drive in off weather related times. But the camera won't have a problem. And we know these cameras won't affect our other cameras that we have going on. But with that being said, are we able to access the, the real time live feed of it or not? Yes, okay. yes, law enforcement, I mean, Anyone they give access to would be able to, I mean, you could stream it to your television at home if you wanted to, or on your computer, but yes, you'd have access, to everything the camera can do, the police department would have access to. So it's, it's essentially, we're putting it in, um, but it's their camera. So they have access to whatever they want inside the camera. We can make that happen. And that is including the 24-7 the live video feed or archivable video. So you can actually go back up to 30 days and look at video. 
And then I guess my question, would we be, uh, Mr. Van would we be able to use this for possibly traffic counts? If that's running all the time or not, or? Yes, it's counting every single object that goes by it and it can actually classify vehicles. So if you wanted to know how many commercial vehicles versus passenger vehicles versus motorcycles were went by, we could actually tell you and then break it down per lane. And then we could actually tell you the speeds of all of them because we're tracking the speed and retaining the speed of every object that moves by. It's only pulling for police review the, the ones that are over that threshold, but the data is still in there and can be reported to you. Ms. Yourself, did you have more? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think this question is for Mike. So, so what are we actually approving tonight? Are we approving the authorization to uh, do an RFP and 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 uh, have an ordinance come before us? Because it seems like there's a lot of input to that ordinance that we would want to have as far as fees and you know, is it going to be uh, based on the speed or the how many times they they have had an infraction or um, what exactly are we approving tonight so you would be approving to continue the process of the implementation of this program which would include all the things you just said okay. so we would bring to the next city council meeting a draft ordinance that would have what we re would recommend would have in it of those things you described and then you would decide if those are the things you wanted in that ordinance Okay. And then that, as I mentioned before, as your standard ordinance process is, you would have three readings of that ordinance. So it would come back to you on February 20th as the first reading. You would decide, okay, this is what we want it to say or not. And so we're going to change this and change that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the first meeting in March, you'd have the second reading. And then on March 20th, you would have the third reading and adopt an ordinance. Once you did that, we then would begin the process of things like a request for proposals to find out which vendor you're going to use and those kinds of things. Okay, so um, a related question then for um, for Chief. Um, do you think that there could be a deterrent factor in this kind of a process? You know, if people received higher fees as they had more and more repeat uh, tickets? You know, as opposed to just every time you speed at 10 miles over, you you pay X. Yeah, and, that, you know, I'd like to, I, like I said, I reached out to Waterloo today, but I, I know their chief is out. I kind of want to get that to see what their thought process was for that. I have not seen that before. I'm used to the traditional method. The faster you go, the more you get fined, you know, and I think there's some benefit to that because the simple fact is that if I'm only 10 over, I'm getting the same fine as somebody that's doing 50 over. I don't know if that's really a deterrent or what we're looking at with that, but I would like to I would like to research more of what Waterloo's thought process was on that. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Barber, I just have one quick question. So, Dorian, you had talked about um, the artificial intelligence. You had talked about the sharing of all the information with the chief and his staff, and then, of course, the uh, snapshot, if you will, to the person that would be issued the citation. But you also mentioned that there's an enormous amount of other information uh, per vehicle moving down in terms of counting uh, the vehicles as well as um, information about the car, et cetera, ownership, et cetera. What happens to that database or is it, is it a proprietary database? Does it um, get stored in perpetuity? What, what do you do with those elements of the intelligence that you're gathering that are not used for the law enforcement citations? Um, well, it's actually just a line of data. So we're not actually running each of those plates. There's not owner information on all those plates. That's the only, the only ones that get run for owner information or registered owner information are the ones that are, that are speeding and then are processed into a ticket. Mm -hmm. So as a camera goes, as, as a car goes by, you know, if it's not speeding, it's just, it just knows what type of vehicle that is, whether it's a big truck or a car mm -hmm. or a motorcycle. Okay. Um, and it's, it's taking what speed it's going at and it's putting it on a line item. And so we can go back, the chief can go in there and, and get that data, which is just in a giant spreadsheet. So, you know, he could do most reports. When you talk about the traffic studies and everything, it would be one of our engineers that actually takes all that data and then 
processes that into a report for the chief saying, okay, here's, because it's usually hundreds and hundreds of pages of data that we have to break down into columns for you. But we're not retaining personal information or even photos that's just a data line. Um, the images that are kept, like videos only kept for 30 days for them to review. It can be kept longer, but that's up to the department. That's just, as you may know, storage space. Um, but the only images and, and, and personal data is kept are the ones that are in citations, and they're only kept through the adjudication process and then whatever the state mandates that you keep it afterwards. And then that's how it. long do your line items remain in the database? Infinitely. Infinitely. Okay. So if you had a program with us 15 years, still you'd be, be able there. to go back and search data from year one okay. to year 15. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jones, did you have any? I don't have any questions. I have comments on okay. to that. Then part. do you have any more questions, Mr. Resnick? Just comments. Just comments? comments? Any other questions? All right, comment time. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Mr. Jones. I, I have a lot of bias in this area, as, as I think you all know, having grown up in public safety, um, having spent 31 years at the fire department, um, all of them as a paramedic, uh, many of them uh, being with patients in the last minutes of life because of bad car crashes, um, thousands of people actually at, uh, in dire straits over that time. So I, I have some bias towards uh, good traffic enforcement. I think it's essential. Um, clearly the city of Dubuque has the authority to do this. I'd, I'd say that we also have the duty to explore all technologies to do a good job of this. The first job of an elected official is the safety of the citizens. And this is all about that. And it's easy for people to send us emails and say, this is a money grab. It's not a money grab. It never was a money grab. I don't give a damn if we make a nickel on this. I want people to slow down and be safe. I want to slow myself down a little bit sometimes and be safer. Um, but that's, that's the fact. Since I've been on city council, calls about uh, speeding motorists outnumber every single other call. Don't have a, a statistical review of this, but by a lot. Every week, there are three or four people that call me and say, man, I, I live down in Rockdale. I live here. I live there. Cars are just flying past you. We've got to do about something about that. Now, very significantly, recently, we had a communication from the North End Neighborhood Association. Not one person, like a cluster of people, very concerned about speeds on Central Avenue through their neighborhood. There are some homes where people are trying to raise kids and live where if you step out the front door, you only have to walk about 14 feet to the traffic lane. They're that close. There's about three feet of sidewalk, about nine feet of parking lane, and then there's cars whizzing past them at 40, 50, 60 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. That's a problem. And they were looking for, can you lower the speed limit? I don't think we can. We had that conversation. Um, but I think we can do this, and I think this is all we can do. Because you can't safely stage patrol vehicles to do the traffic stops. There's no place to park them to watch for the, the speeders. Um, so at the volume of traffic going past to catch up to the violator is a challenge. And now you've got a problem of where do you, where do you actually perform the stop? How do you successfully get the patrol vehicle and the offending vehicle out of the traffic into a position of safety and keep everybody safe till the stop, stop is concluded? And how many cars are whizzing past you while you do all of that? Now, if we were Los Angeles or Chicago or New York City or Dallas, and you had a, a problem with an area like Central Avenue where you've got a speed issue, you could throw 20 cars at it per shift for a week, and you could probably call most of your speed issue. We can't put 20 cars on it. We can't put two cars on it because we haven't got the human resource. We haven't got the physical resource. And because the calls for service are running so high, that just simply can't be done. So what can you do? You can reach into technology and find what's working many, many other places in North America, including many places in Iowa. Lastly, uh, I, well, I think I did my five points that I want to see. Lastly, it's, it's about safety. It's only about safety. It was all, all it was ever about was safety. And I appreciate the positions of people that are writing us and saying it's not about that. And I wish you'd pay attention to the documents that we've read. I wish you'd pay attention to the things that were said tonight in the presentations. Um, I wish you'd sign up for the Citizens Police Academy and learn what it's like from, from that position of view. Um, as opposed to sitting at home on their computers. So the people that just wanted to call me names this week, too bad. I don't know what you wanted in the first place. Um, but I'm still here. And I'm still supporting this because it's the right thing to do to improve the safety of the people driving down the street. Um, those poor people on Central Avenue with, with 14 feet between their front door and their traffic, we better manage that traffic. 
the Northwest Air Trio, we can't have 75, 85, 95 mile an hour speeds. We just can't. People get hurt. Things go wrong. And uh, things happen. I, I remember when, uh, when they first raised the speed limit across Nebraska and how great I thought that was. I used to make a lot of trips to Colorado with family out there. Man, at 85 miles an hour, stuff happens fast. Of course, the speed limit was 75 miles an hour, but if you didn't want to get rear-ended, you drove 85 miles an hour. And I think that's uh, one of the concerns that I heard here tonight is that ambient traffic flow can, can cause you to speed when you don't really care to, but you don't feel safe not doing it. It's just in the Chicago suburbs. I, I get that. Um, but here's a situation where we've got to do something. And here's a substantial something that addresses it. How do we not do it? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. John. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. Yes, thank you. Um, I have to first off tell you that I tend to agree with the group that Mr. Jones is a part of also, and that's the Iowa ACLU, which is against this speed cameras. And they're heavy handed. Why? Well, 99% of the citations have no correlating collision. We just have a scatter shot and we just try to get everybody. And, and, and yes, heavy handed things work. Uh, you could all make your own list of heavy handed things that work, but is that the right way to do it? So uh, if uh, it's not a goal priority, you can see we spent so many hours over a brief talk. We didn't get a work session. We didn't tell folks about this three months ahead. We didn't collect all the data like we should. Uh, so I, I guess I have problems with this. There is, um, um, the chief had next steps. If approved, then all these things will happen. Well, they need to happen before we approve them because as, as uh, Ms. Roussel pointed out or got them to admit, once they're in your community, they ain't leaving. They're gonna be here, here, and this will be the mayor and council that gets speed cameras in Dubuque, okay. And it'll always be such. So, first of all, it's not a goal priority. Imagine Dubuque, 6,000 citizens, nobody asks for speed cameras. Uh, so, uh, a couple things. I would love to think it's not a money grab, and I wouldn't say it's a money grab, but there's a money issue. And uh, if there was no money issue, I'm like the chief. I would say, I'm not worried about the money. We should give the money to charity. How about United Way? But as part of Mr. Van Milligan's presentation, he's got all these uses for critical, uh, in, in, integral parts of city operations. So the, the money is used for funding city operations. Um, so I, 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 it's not that we don't care. We don't, uh, you know, we don't care about the money. It's only safety. No, we've got uses for it. And, and it'll, never, it'll never go away. We'll always have these traffic uh, safety um, issues and, and, and costs. So we're going to be using them for those things, I guess. Um, the other thing is, I guess, well, let me wrap it up here in just a couple things. First of all, the S-curve in Cedar Rapids, I get how that could be appropriate. You know, we don't have any S-curve on 380 going, you know, 55 miles an hour. We don't have a situation like that. Um, so that might be appropriate. But for all those different things that I've mentioned tonight that we're not ready for, and uh, the statement was made, no cost to the city. Well, our citizens are the city of Dubuque. And they're going to be, if they drive like everybody else in Iowa or similar, <clears throat> We're going to have millions of dollars collected by these ticket cameras and not spent on local re restaurants, local arts and, and events, local businesses. You know, uh, $100 means uh, it's very different for some people than others here in Dubuque. And, and for some people, you know, it's 100 bucks. Oh, well, I tip that much at a certain restaurant. I don't know. But for others, that is a calamity. We haven't gone through, we have this fines and fees uh, committee that hasn't been consulted. We have, how can we see these cameras through an equity lens? Well, we don't know. We haven't asked, we haven't done our due diligence. I think it's funny, we have speed cameras and we're speeding this through way too fast. Citizens, Chamber of Commerce, ask us to delay this, maybe. You know, I'm not gonna move to the table yet till I hear everybody's 
idea that there might be something to that. But again, finally, usually we are prepared by the staff to say, here's what's coming. And, and they, they, let us, they let us really consider this. And now we get everything. We got a lot of stuff from the city manager today. And, and we get no presentations. I mean, the presentations weren't included. It is going way too fast for as huge as this is going to be for our citizens in Dubuque. I'm all for safety. We need to do it the right way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Other final thoughts? Mr. Stell. Sure. Um, when, I, when I came in, I, I, I wasn't sure. Um, because I had, as I said earlier, I had a lot of questions. But I really appreciated the presentations answering those questions. And, and it, when it didn't, I was able to ask them. Um, in addressing one of the Mr. Resnick's concern, I, one thing I liked was adding to the next steps a reporting process so that periodically we can review this. And if we feel it's not effective, um, we will have the opportunity to, um, to talk about it again. Um, I like the opportunity to review the ordinance when it comes and um, have that discussion. Um, I'd like to see it take the full three readings so that there's additional time for that review and input. Um, and so I, I'm going to support this, but I'm going to be watchful as we're going through the process to make sure that any ad additional questions that I have are answered and that we're um, building in um, reporting and uh, making sure that this is not only a, a good impact on our safety and that, that it's effective and that we can show our citizens that it is effective. Um, so thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. Um, I'll begin just by saying I consider the health and safety of my constituents my priority. Um, I consider the safety of our uniformed officers my priority. I think this action item is in line with these priorities. Respectfully, if this passes tonight, I will plan to consider support for the final ordinance if we can consider the revenue created by the ordinance is committed more directly to the recruitment and retention of our first responders, police, fire, 911 dispatch. I doubt nothing about your presentation, Chief. I appreciate all of the time and energy you've put into this and um, Mr. Van Milligan and your staff. I had a lot of questions, and a lot of those questions literally came up for me in the last 24 hours. And I feel like I would like more time to process it. It feels as though there is enough concern voiced by my constituents that I need to pause and further consider recommendations overall. A more in-depth examination of other cities' policies and experiences outside of what Cedar Rapids data showed us would be very helpful for me. I'm curious about other ways of encouraging behavior change to moderate speed. I would be in favor of returning to the discussion after I feel that there has been a more broad opportunity to consider data and review it myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Sprank, I look both ways at the same time. Ms. Farber. <laughs> uh, Ms. Farber. Okay. Well, um, I um, agree with my colleagues here that um, we do need a bit more time in order to digest all this great information that we have received and also to um, step up to the constituent needs, if you will, and request and interest that has been expressed tonight as well. And, and Jeremy, I really hope that in that list of to-dos, we do put some kind of a group together, uh, whether it's just um, a town hall or a commission specifically to help monitor and work with you on the design. I think that's just a step in the right direction. And um, I support this, but I do agree that, you know, maybe we do take time and do it in three readings to give us more time 
uh, for um, helping you, as a matter of fact, as you go through this step too, because for you to do this in two weeks is a very short period also. Um, so I think that would be uh, good guidance uh, coming in both directions, if you will, to make this uh, collaborative and to work uh, to the best interest of everyone. So I will support this, and I look forward to the uh, phased-in approach. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sprank. Um, as the councilman who threw out a crazy idea a month ago of slowing down traffic, and that was shot down, that was one ordinance we have power over. Now we're creating an ordinance because folks don't want to slow down. Romberg, Kaufman, Peru Road, 32nd Street, Sheridan, Roosevelt, Lincoln, Garfield, Jackson, Central, and White are the 11 streets I've gotten calls on that rotate around. And I will send an email. And then they'll eventually, they'll, the enforcement ideas that we have met used, we'll put up one of those little uh, mobile speed thingies. Yeah, that'll last for 30 days. People slow down. Then it goes away. Then they don't slow down. <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. I, I frankly don't. We just want to be safe. We don't want any of our families to get hurt. We don't want any of our kids to get hurt. We've asked people to slow down. We've tried to throw it. This is the last thing. And I'm sorry if it sounds a little heavy handed. But it seems like this is the only option we're left with. So I'm in full support of this. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Just a final comment. A, a dear friend of mine who's kind of a senior statesman said, good policy often is not good politics, but good governance requires good policies. And that's the challenge before you today. Absolutely. Well, I want to start my comments by just thanking everybody for this evening. I mean, you look at the clock. We've been here a while talking about this. Um, and, and I have some comments on the process of it, I think, too, in, in, as part of my comments here. But um, I appreciate the depth with which we as a council, and you in particular, as council members and my colleagues, um, want to explore an issue such as this. Um, anybody who says that we don't listen to them, uh, I think is just proved wrong by a discussion like this. You, you've, I've heard you ask the same questions that I saw coming through in email um, very specifically. So I appreciate the discussion that you've just had. Um, Chief Jensen, and, and to you and your entire force, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, you know, be able to, to take a look at this. Uh, Mr. Grubaugh, thank you for being here tonight and sharing with your expertise with us as well. And, and of course, you know, Mike and, and your team, uh, as, as a part of this proposal. Um, I'm just gonna be blat like, pretty bluntly honest about, about this, because this is not the, the last time we're talking about um, cameras and technology and artificial intelligence in this chamber. This is gonna come up again and it's gonna come up fairly soon. And if I'm being honest with everybody, I gotta tell you, as, as, a, as a citizen of a free and democratic society, I do feel uneasy about the expansion of artificial intelligence and technology and its use in surveillance of us as a as people as residents of a city or residents of a country or anywhere it makes me uneasy it started when i read 1984 in high school i'll be honest with you and then i became a huge science fiction fan and i'm telling you those stories they scare you but i get this i the reason that those stories stick with me is because we have seen examples over and over again of humans behaving badly when they use this technology. We can name all kinds of them. I mean, on a large global scale, we can talk about countries that have abused this. Um, there's a new Frontline documentary out that just came out a couple weeks ago about uh, a spy software that a bunch of countries used and started spying on journalists. Um, and, and actually use them to kill people. I mean, it, it's, it's horrible what can happen with some of these things when they're abused and used poorly. Those are the concerns that I hear when I listen to people who, um, you know, some of the people who wrote us today, um, some of them more appropriately than others, I might add, um, in the way that they express their opinions. But um, I get the reason for those opinions. I mean, it is a concern when your government is watching you for whatever reason. It's a constitutional concern. So I want to put that out there, that this is something we always have to think about when we talk about using technology to do the job that humans have done for a very long time. 
But it really just comes down to this, that statement, you know, when with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, that's really what this is about. If we are to move this forward, we have to do it very responsibly. And I, and I have to tell you, I mean, what I've heard here tonight is an outline of how we have a police department and a city staff and us here as policymakers who are ready to do the responsible thing with this particular proposal and try to do this in the best way that we possibly can. And I, I believe in the people who are saying that. I, I believe in our ability to do this in a responsible fashion. Um, Mr. Resnick, I'm gonna disagree with you on one thing on the, on the ACLU comment you made. You know, I've read a lot from the ACLU as well about this, and um, there's also the Brennan Center for Justice. There's some other um, uh, sources that I've looked into to try and figure this whole thing out. It's gonna come up again because um, it, it talk a lot more about things that are even more automated than these license plate readers. It's not that the ACLU and these groups entirely disagree with this technology. What they, what they wanna make sure is that it's done responsibly that we put things in place, safeguards in place, to make sure that we are, um, are using this technology in a way that is, is not going to violate the rights of people who haven't done anything wrong. So I'm interested when I hear things like, you know, are we gathering information on people who are not breaking the law? Well, yes and no is kind of the answer we got tonight. We're gathering information on cars that are driving by. But if nobody's doing anything wrong, then we're not gonna be doing anything with that information other than keeping it to be able to look at see like, how many people were speeding all at once, right? Or uh, how many people were going a certain speed on a, on a certain roadway. If we're gonna do this, it has to be about safety. It cannot be about revenue. Um, I believe that is the reason that we are doing it. That's what I heard here tonight. We're doing this about safety. This is not about making a buck. Here's the deal though. We're gonna make revenue on this. That's the way this also works. So I don't wanna just, gloss over that, there will be revenue coming our way. So how we spend them, as well, you pointed out some specific ideas on that, I think is going to be really important. So we, we have to think about what we're going to do with that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going through my notes here and they're super tiny, so excuse me. Um, I think the decision tonight is actually the easy one. Do we move forward with this discussion? I say the answer for me is yes. I do think that it's time to move forward with this discussion. Uh, if we had this to do over again, I think we should have had a work session first. I mean, if we had the process to do over again, I, I think it's something to learn from here because I do think it would have been good to have some sort of an idea, throw this out there for everybody to talk about and then we can discuss it a little bit more and bring it to the table for a decision. Um, but. I also don't think that this was a terrible way of starting this discussion. We had a very thorough one this evening. I do think we should slow this down, have three readings of an ordinance if we're going to move forward with an ordinance so that we can refine that, talk about the best way to do it. As we refine that, there are some things that I think are, are really important. Um, we, we need to talk about how we're gonna report this data and what that's really gonna look like. I would really like to hear some clear ideas about what those reports are gonna look like, what data we're gonna capture, how we're gonna to talk to the public about this, how we're gonna audit our processes and our information. I think those things are incredibly important as we discuss how we're going to do this. It's not just about putting signs up to say, you're being tracked by a speed camera, so slow down. I wanna know exactly how this is working. And, and I think you know the looking at this quarterly for a year or at least, you know two times in one year, and then maybe annually after that, makes a lot of sense. Because I do think that we have to think about um, making sure that what we're doing is actually working. I also wanna know a little bit more about who's going to access the data, how they're gonna access this data. Um, we got some answers on, you know, um, depending on who we go with, for, you know, after we put an RFP out, how long this data will be saved. Um, I think those things, and then how we're gonna protect it so people that do access that aren't able to do anything that would be, um, uh, that would, aren't, aren't able to abuse that power that they have. You know, specifically the police officers that are looking at this. I think this, the public needs to know that if we're gonna do this, we have practices in place that don't allow abuse. Along with that, just the transparency to make sure that everything is, you know, that the, 
people know how this works. They, they know what we're going to set it at as far as what speed you're going to be able to go. Um, and, you know, just so they have a, a general comfort and understanding of what that really looks like. Know where all these are. We're not going to surprise people. We're going to announce we're going to be moving these, these ones around um, that can move around. I think all of that is, is something that we need to make sure that we do as we, as we look through all this. And then, you know, the, the biggest question as we look through these reports is, does it work? Is it doing what we want it to do? Um, you know, what is our goal? If the goal is to, to reduce speeding by, let's just say 50%, because that's the number that was thrown out tonight, we need to track that on a regular basis and make sure that's actually working. The final point is um, one that uh, Mr. Resnick brought up that is absolutely apropos. The Iowa legislature goes after these every single year. So whatever we do, we need to do with our eyes fully wide open and recognize that we may be having lots of discussion, we may be up pretty late tonight, and by the end of this legislative session have absolutely no power to do anything about this. We need to recognize that that's a possibility. I don't think that precludes us from having the discussion, though. I actually think that this right here, this discussion that we started tonight, can be a model for what our legislature can look at to say, maybe this is a way that a city can do this right. They talk about this in depth. We move this forward in a way that the public gets really good input. I don't see any problem with that. If that's something that in the end our, our community wants, then we should be able to move forward with it. And I don't think that should be up to the Iowa legislature. So I'm gonna support this. I'm gonna support this, um, and my mind wasn't made up coming in here tonight. I, I really did, and because of this unease that I have with just surveillance in general. Um, but I, I, do, I do want uh, to continue this conversation. I, I would like to see an ordinance in front of us and then uh, be able to slowly move through that so we can have a full discussion as a community. So I think each of us has said our piece. I think we've been talking about this for quite a while. Again, appreciate the discussion. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go back to, we had a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank to receive and file and approve. And uh, Adrian, would you call the roll please? Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Nay. Resnick? No. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. That motion passes five to two. Action item number four is Terry Goodman appointment to National Capital Planning Commission. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Farber? I move that we receive and file. Okay. Got a motion by Farber and a second by Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. Um, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, I just want to acknowledge that uh, President Joe Biden has appointed our uh, Director of Strategic Partnerships, uh, Terry Hawks Goodman, as the chair of the National Capital Planning Commission. Now, it has no relationship to her employment with the City of Dubuque. It, it's separate and distinct from that, but I think it is a great honor that she was appointed to this position, and I think it reflects very positively on her and, quite frankly, us as a community and us as an organization. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Mike, for putting this as an action item and for bringing this to everyone's attention. Um, this is a great honor, it really is, to be appointed to this. Um, you know, you think of some major um, monuments and, and places of, you know, all within our memory in Washington, D.C., and uh, we have someone we know very well who we know is very capable um, who's making some important decisions about those places now. So congratulations to Terry Goodman. You're here. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you again, Mike. We have a motion by uh, Ms. Farber, a second by Russell on that one, uh, to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number five is tax increment ordinance for the Twin Valley Urban Renewal Area. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second. Yes. And a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council review and adopt an ordinance creating the tax increment financing district for the Twin Valley Urban Renewal Area. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Seeing none, 
The motion is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Uh, Jones and Roussel with a second. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and adoption of the ordinance. Second. Motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number six is National Endowment for the Arts, Local Arts Agency, American Rescue Plan Act, Arts Operating Recovery Subgrant Funding Recommendation. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? Yes, I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Sprank. A motion by Resnick and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, Arts and Cultural Affairs Manager Jenny Peterson Brandt is recommending City Council approval of the funding recommendation from the Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission for awards to nonprofit organizations to the NEA, LAA, ARPA funded Arts Operating Recovery Subgrant Program. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. I see Ms. Brandt is here. Yes. And if, if she wouldn't mind coming up and, and telling the people who are still up at uh, 1027 tonight <laughs> about, <laughs> about the uh, uh, wonderful work that not only your staff did, but what this means to the arts community here in Dubuque. Uh, yeah, so this um, award, if you take your brains all the way back to November 2021, um, we were awarded a half a million dollar grant from the National Endowment for the Arts with the purpose of using that funding to subgrant out to support the recovery of our arts um, nonprofit organizations um, with that overall budget. 435 of it was dedicated to this program that we're looking at specifically in this action item. Um, 15,000 of it was dedicated is dedicated to your next action item coming up, and then um, 50,000 of it is dedicated to the staffing support for all of this new programming that we are developing. So um, I will add that with this arts operating recovery piece, one of the great pieces of flexibility that we were able to have, thanks to um, uh, the NEA sort of allowing us to define some of the parameters within um, who we wanted to fund with this. Um, we are actually not only able to fund um, those organizations that we would normally be providing that general operating support to organizations like the Dubuque Museum of Art, Fly By Night Productions, um, sort of the quote unquote arts focused um, nonprofit organizations, but we're also looking at funding um, organizations who have a very substantial component of arts activities, um, arts education, arts enrichment within a um, broader mission that they might have. So within this recommendation, you'll see some funding that is going, that is recommended to the Boys and Girls Club of Dubuque and also to uh, St. Mark Youth Enrichment, so. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Does Mayor. Does that cover it? Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Like I'm, I'm glad you asked Ms. Peterson Brand to come up today. Uh, it, it was we knew you're sitting back there, and you have two really important items from a really substantial award. I mean, this is this is very substantial. This says a lot about the professionalism of the office that you're running and everything that's going on in Dubuque. So thank you. Thanks. And if I can just give a shout out to Laura Merrick, who is also with us. She is the um, Communications and Grants Administration Support Assistant, who we were able to hire for a short-term basis through um, this NEA program. So she has done a lot of the heavy lifting on this and I just applaud her work and jumping in, cannonballing into it and just doing a fantastic job with helping to manage all of this. Excellent, well thank you so much. All right, well we have a motion by Resnick, second by Sprank to receive a file and approve. Adrian, would you call the roll please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number seven is application guidelines for the Creative Empowerment Subgranting Program funded by the National Endowment for the Arts American Rescue Plan Act. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and approve. Second. Motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, 
Arts and Cultural Affairs Manager Jenny Peterson Brandt is recommending City Council review and approve the provided creative empowerment subgranting program administration materials. Upon approval, staff will proceed with releasing said materials, promoting the opportunity, and accepting applications. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? We kind of discussed it in the last item a little bit, so yeah, thank you again. All right, motion is uh, received and filed and approved by Resnick, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Seven zero. Action item number eight is proposed amendment to Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission ordinance regarding term expirations. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage in two council meetings, part of the meeting at which is to be finally passed, be suspended. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Arts and Cultural Affairs Manager Jenny Peterson Brandt is recommending City Council approval of the amendment to the Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission Ordinance. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? I just want to say, I mean, this is a, it's very process oriented, this ordinance we're changing here, uh, but it, it really makes sense. I mean, to be able to stagger the, the commission members' terms makes, makes much more sense in the way that it's laid out, so thank you for your work on this. Motion is by Jones and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? We move final consideration on passage of the ordinance. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number nine is marketing and staffing update for leisure services seasonal employees. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file. Second. Motion by Roussel, second by Resnick. Mike, please. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Public Information Officer Randy Gale and Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware are submitting a marketing and staffing update for leisure services seasonal employees. I don't believe we have a presentation. It's just available to answer any questions if you have them. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Any questions or discussion? Mr. Spring. Wednesday, there is a thing at MFC for, that'd be the only thing I would have to say. Okay. I just can't remember if it's in here. The MFC, uh, what time, Marie? I can say it out loud. Yeah. 5.30 to 7 p.m. at the MFC on Wednesday, this Wednesday the 8th, that'll be. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I actually just want to say I'm very impressed with the amount of work that you've put into this. You know, when, um, when we've struggled in the past couple of summers, you immediately took action. We've had multiple discussions about this, and this is the result of that, and it's still going. I mean, you're not, you're not done yet. You're still working on this. So thank you to everyone in the, the leisure services, uh, the park staff, uh, recreation staff. This is... I think this is great work. I think you're moving exactly in the right direction, so thank you. All right, we have a motion by, excuse me, Roussel, and a second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 10 is Water and Resource Recovery Center Odor Reduction Update. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second. Okay. A motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Um, Mike, coming to you, we're going straight to, all right. Yeah, we'll go right to Willie. Okay, Willie, hop on up there, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh and city council members. I'm Willie O'Brien, manager of the city's water and resource recovery center. I'm here tonight to provide an update on odor reduction efforts at the Water and Resource Recovery Center. <clears throat> For those in the public that may not know much about what we do, um, in 2013, the City of Dubuque unveiled the Water and Resource Recovery Center. 
And that was nearly a $70 million upgrade of the former water pollution control plant that uh, processes the city's wastewater. Uh, the wastewater coming from the community, from residents, uh, businesses, industries. And that was actually the largest capital improvement project that the city had taken on up to that time. Um, part of that, the one of the big improvements with that project was the introduction of uh, anaerobic digestion. And it provides uh, financial and environmental benefits over the incineration uh, that it took place of. But it also uh, provides conditions that produce odorous compounds such as hydrogen sulfide. Uh, in the anaerobic digestion process, sulfur reducing bacteria break down sulfate and produce hydrogen sulfide and other odorous sulfur compounds. The production of sulfur compounds can vary over time with changes in wastewater characteristics and can occur anywhere in the treatment process where low or zero oxygen con conditions exist, such as in long force mains, those are the pressurized sewer pipes that pump the sewage to the plant. Because of Dubuque's topography, we tend to have some, we have some very long force main sewers. Um, I think the largest, longest one is, is approximately three or four miles long. Um, and then also we have um, some settling basins at the Water and Resource Recovery Center where things sit um, and allow solids to separate by gravity. Uh, and that also can produce conditions where odors can occur. Um, over the past few years, the Water and Resource Recovery Center has received an increasing number of odor complaints. To address the increase in odors, we are working with a consultant, working with consulting engineers to design improved high strength waste receiving and handling facilities. This project will provide dedicated storage tanks, which will reduce the production of odorous compounds by isolating the high strength waste from wastewater treatment solids, wastewater treatment solids prior to digestion. We are investigating the sources of sulfur, uh, which can be broken down into hydrogen sulfide including contributions from domestic wastewater, industrial wastewater, hauled waste, and sulfur that naturally occurs in the drinking water supply. We are investigating the impact of physical sewer infrastructure, as I mentioned, on the conversion of oxidized sulfur compounds, the sulfate, to reduce sulfur compounds such as hydrogen sulfide. In the summer of uh, 2000, or 2022, uh, we investigated adding iron salts um, to the digestion process, but at that time, unfortunately, the commodity level chemicals uh, were not accessible and due to, uh, I guess it's a byproduct of steel pickling and due to some of the steel uh, refinery shutdowns that was not available. Um, later on, we had gotten access to a chemical that um, it was a manufactured product, but it would have been at a cost of about $600,000 per year, uh, which we did not believe the utility could afford. Um, this past December, however, we invited a vendor uh, to conduct some on-site jar testing of several different chemicals um, that, are, that are used to uh, reduce the production of hydrogen sulfide. So the tests were conducted with about five different chemicals in several diff on several different wastewater streams at the plant. Uh, we continue to work with the consultants to further expand our understanding of odor production and to provide continued guidance on odor mitigation. Along with these efforts, we'll continue to work with the consultant to complete the design of the dedicated high strength waste handling system. Uh, the consultants expected to deliver an updated <coughs> estimate of construction costs during the 90% design review meeting later this month. We hope to bid the project in late spring uh, or summer of 2023, and uh, construction of the project could begin as early as fall of 2023, uh, but the projected completion will depend on lead time for some of the critical components. We'll also continue working with consultants to further develop our understanding of odor production and odor mitigation options. Um, and we will be working with this vendor uh, to pilot the injection of chemicals, uh, potentially hydrogen peroxide, um, into the wastewater influent and blended sludge. Uh, we'll continue uh, to identify odor reduction expenses, uh, which you'll see some in the upcoming budget process, um, operating and capital um, budgets for inclusion in future budget requests. 
And I just wanted to mention that the city is working toward finalizing our request for proposals for a sanitary sewer asset master plan, which will examine the condition of current sanitary sewer collection, conveyance, and treatment infrastructure. And information gathered in that planning effort will be used to inform future improvements to the city's sanitary sewer infrastructure, including the Water and Resource Recovery Center. So that is what I have, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Willie. Question, yeah, Ms. Farber. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, and I can't tell you how much <clears throat> I greatly appreciate the update. Um, and I look forward to sharing this information about the phased-in approach to um, hopefully uh, resting the odor abatement issue uh, that is permeating in that area. So I, I greatly appreciate the phased-in approach and all the work that you're doing to um, move it forward because the infrastructure is very important, I think, to the city uh, as well as to the neighborhoods that are kind of co-located with you. So thank you very much for the update. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Yeah, a couple questions. First of all, are we getting a break? Does the winter cold keep the smell down as well? I would say it does help. One of the main um, areas that we're seeing odor come out of is this blended sludge tank that collects some of the sludges um, uh, from the treatment process. So that has the bacteria, microbes uh, that we use to break down the waste. And some of the hauled wastes are being introduced into that tank where they're mixed with those microbes. So in the warmer weather, you're probably going to see more microbial action, more odor production. In the cold weather, it's going to be cut down. Thank you. And I noticed that there's a whole bunch of odor scrubber machines out there that people are selling to industrial wastewater plants. And they're pretty expensive. My concern about the chemical, does the, does the chemical that you're talking about, Ryan, does it eliminate or mask the smell? It would actually, well, there are a few different chemicals that we could use. Um, the chemicals that we are looking at actually bind up the sulfur, so it, it doesn't mask it. It, it um, essentially prevents it from becoming uh, volatile or airborne. Great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Wethel. So thank you, because um, between Chief, you, Willie, and John, I think we're pulling a late nighter, and I appreciate your time. So thank you. And to get up and give a presentation this late at night is pretty challenging um, for anyone, so thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, one comment I have for you, Mr. Resnick, I just looked back, uh, I had a constituent on January 3rd um, tell me that it was not amenable for them to slightly open their window. So um, although I think it's much better in the winter, um, it does not mean that it does not happen and does not happen at times frequently for folks. So the feedback I've received from constituents continues to be frustrating for certain. Um, I appreciate all of the kind of preciseness of how you set out our steps and goals. I would say the only feedback I have for us as a city truly is we need to move faster. Um, I know that that's not an easy thing to do, but um, people have been dealing with this odor issue for some time and we need to take it seriously. Uh, since 2013, then, we've made $2 million. $600,000 is a lot of money until we have a process in place to at least make a start. Is there a certain time of the year when the smell is the worst that we could at least trial that while we're waiting to move forward with some of these things? I'm just throwing, I don't know how realistic that is, but um, when we talked about the iron salts previously, that was the feedback I received. So whatever happened with the iron salts? $600,000. Is our fresh air and air that we breathe not worth that to our city? And so I want people to know that we are taking it seriously. I think that these steps are great steps. Um, I just think we as a city need to move forward with more urgency. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. I'll follow that question up. Is, is there a way to speed up the process that we're doing right now? I mean, because I, I also appreciate all the steps that you've worked through. I mean, we've been hearing about them, and, and, and we know you're working hard. But is there a way for us to speed up, given the, what the situation or our reality is, I guess? 
Well, one of the, so through this recent round of um, chemical testing that we conducted with this vendor, um, they tested a chemical hydrogen peroxide that we had not looked at before. I believe that's something we could probably implement relatively quickly into our blended sludge tank, which is one of the, the key areas for odor production. And actually the cost was very low. Um, so that's something uh, we, I think we can get, get started on very quickly here. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, and I would comment, if, I mean, if it shows promise, um, that's great, but I also, I, I'd hate for us to jump into something just because, you know, because we want to hurry. But um, I think whatever we can do to speed up the process, I mean, I have to agree. It's, it's uh, we all know we've been dealing with this for, for quite a while. So whatever we're able to do, I, I think anybody would appreciate. But thank you, Willie. All right, well, thank you for your presentation. Um, we appreciate it. The Thank motion you. is to, do you have any, anything else? Or? Nope. Okay, wonderful. Motion is to uh, receive and file and um, hear the presentation. So, um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 11 is update to the administrative plan for assisted housing programs. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I would receive and file the documents and adopt the resolutions. Second. Get to work. <laughs> Got a uh, motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Uh, Mike, do you have any? Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council adopt the updated administrative plan for the Public Housing Authority. Fiscal year 2024 annual plan includes applying a residency preference point to help increase lease up rates while the number of vacant units accepting housing choice vouchers in Dubuque is scarce. The Housing Commission has approved this update. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Well, Alexis, when you when you come to give a presentation at this time, are you just are you ending your today or are you starting are you just here for work for the next day? I mean, at this point, I might point, just keep working. Yeah, like this is this, <laughs> this is seriously point. the late night shift. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. So the floor is yours. Uh, Alexis Seiger, Housing Community Development Director. Um, thank you for having me tonight. This is um, I'm going to try to make it quick based on uh, timing, but um, want to make sure you have a lot of time for questions. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are presenting the administrative plan um, for the city council to adopt. The administrative plan is different than an annual plan. Uh, administrative plan is actually um, all of the regulations that come down from HUD and tell us exactly how we're going to operate the housing choice voucher program. This is all the way down to how we select people. Um, it's an 800 page document, so it is very detailed on how we will administer our program. Um, Basically, uh, there's an entire chapter about fair housing, and um, this keeps us up to date with all of our equitable um, laws and things that change throughout the year. So that is what the goal is with the administrative plan. Um, when we update the plan, it is not required that we do public input because it is about laws and regulations on how to run the program. We have an annual plan that you set the public hearing for earlier today. Um, that does a lot more of the planning on um, bigger thought processes on how to get landlords to accept vouchers and things like that. Um, so what we do in this one is we still try to get input because it's very important, but a lot of times it's focused on the people who are already participating in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So we have a resident advisory board who met to discuss this as well as our housing commission. Um, so we make sure that we're getting, um, public is allowed to come and comment at those uh, the administrative plan does have to go quickly, so there are not um, setting public hearings. So some of the things that we um, are updating in the plan and we look at when we update the plan is obviously those laws and regulations, but also how can we streamline services within those laws and regulations? Um, how can we make sure that we are always reviewing the fair housing laws? Um, and this time we reviewed the residency preference. And um, how can we ease the burden on landlords and residents? So we've, you know, those are the things that we looked at this time as we're updating the plan. Uh, I'm gonna quick do some details on what we're actually updating. So since we adopted the plan in 2020, we have almost three years of updates. Um, the feds updated in section three. Um, they also updated, which, which is for working low mod income um, persons and priority for that. 
They also updated their guidebook, which is basically all the way rules that are passed by the feds, and then HUD's interpretation of those. Um, the, uh, the Violence Against Women's Act had updates that were passed last year, and they also allowed through COVID remote um, options for a lot of things like briefings, inspections, et cetera. So we added those into our admin plan. And then we have a uh, system that HUD provides to look for income. Um, it's called the EIV system, and there needs to be a disclosure to residents before they come onto the program that, that we're gonna use that system. So that's through their social security that's reported um, on their income. The other thing that we do that kind of did a mass update this time was we actually use Nan McKay as our consultant and they have a model plan. That model plan updates all the federal regulations um, without us having to try to do that all ourselves. And so we did um, update to the 2022 model of that plan. That is the newest plan they have out and available. So one of the big changes is in chapter four, um, which is called applications, waiting lists, and tenant selection. Um, we are going in this chapter, uh, we are proposing a residency preference be applied to applicants at the pre-application stage. Um, the reason being low our low lease up rates. So in the past five years, we sit around 60 to 65% success rate for leasing up. And that's once we hand you a voucher, your 60 to 65% of people are successful at actually using that voucher in a unit. Um, in 2022, we're now experiencing a 25% success rate, a significant drop um, that needs a change. It's not something small, it is not an, an anomaly. We have to change something. Um, and since we cannot change our source of income ordinance and we cannot change other things, this is kind of our last resort. Uh, we started looking at this in 2021 because of some um, issues with um, absorption from other public housing authorities when they, someone decides to take their voucher somewhere else. And then our low leasing rates uh, kind of solidified the fact that we need this. Um, because of those low leasing rates, HUD did award the city uh, um, just over a million dollars. That million dollars is what we did not use last year. So we had an allocated budget of just over six million and we only used just over five because we could not get people leased up. Not because we weren't putting vouchers on the street, not because people weren't trying to lease up, but because we actually couldn't do it. So HUD let us apply to try to keep that money, but that means we need to spend it this year. If we don't spend it this year, our budget decreases. So I wanna give a history about preference points. Um, you may have heard in the past, we have had some issues um, with the residency preference points. So we were audited by the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity back in 2011. Um, with that audit, there was a letter of finding that they issued to the city in 2013 um, that alleged discrimination based on the grounds of race. Um, there were several things within that uh, letter, but it led to the voluntary compliance agreement that was signed in 2014. That agreement lasted for seven years and asked us to update our administrative plan, um, asked us to remove the residency preference points, it also asked us to create a new wait list for those that had been purged off the wait list um, before the letter of findings so that we could put them back on. Um, also had us add a preference point for very low income or extremely low income residents. Um, and then they had us do a lot of data collection that um, just makes it easier to know if you are uh, affecting someone of a protected class more than others. So specifically in the letter of findings, um, it was several things that came about. It wasn't just one change that they said, this change is causing discrimination. Um, and it, what they call it is disparate impact. Um, it's not intended discrimination. It's not something that says, we don't want you to apply just because you're a female or because you are black. It is something that happens because data or the, the policy itself just creates a disparate impact for those of a protected class. Um, so what they had said was it's several different choices over four years for the city that caused that. One of those was a full residency requirement. Um, we did not actually implement that. The letter of findings came out before that, but we had residency preference points as well. So in the voluntary compliance agreement, uh, we are done with that. So seven years is up. Um, but even before that seven years was up, in April of 2019, HUD modified our VCA because we did so well in the city of Dubuque. Um, we made sure we were intentionally um, keeping a lot of extra data. Um, we were also trying to get more landlord acceptance, things that we, um, you as a city council made choices, and they said those are great choices. 
So um, they modified it to make it easier. And then in March of 21, the VCA ended. The voluntary compliance agreement was terminated. Uh, we did keep a partnership or a, a good connection with the Office of Fair Housing. Um, unfortunately, our representative at the Office of Fair Housing retired in November of 2021, uh, which we found out when I emailed them asking them about residency preference. So we did try to work with the Office of Fair Housing at HUD. Um, in August of 2021, we were actually leasing up a lot at the beginning of the year, and they told us to stop. We did that because we always have a drop at the end of the year as other public housing authorities absorb our vouchers and we can't spend our budget. So we did it intentionally and HUD told us to stop. Well, what happened is we ended up with a shortfall committee from HUD that told us what you need, the only way to combat this is a residency preference point. Um, you'll, you'll be able to lease people up faster um, to make up for those vouchers. So this, for us, raised some red flags and we said, well, we have a history. We're gonna ask the Office of Fair Housing what they think, because the HUD offices are separate. Our HUD office that runs our program and the Fair Housing office are two separate offices and they do not talk to each other. I don't mean that in a bad way, they just don't. So just, it's very important that they don't talk to each other. Um, so November of 21, I sent an email to our Office of Fair Housing and said, hey, we were told that residency preference might be our only option for keeping our budget here in the city of Dubuque. So here's our stats right now and all the things we've collected in the past. We think we're in a good place. Can you, can you consult with us? Uh, we got no response. Uh, we did ask for other people to contact and so we eventually we contacted the director of the Office of Fair Housing. Um, in June of 2022, she responded and said, hey, we'll get back to you. Um, we got a phone call and they said, we don't really know what this means. Um, everybody who had history with the city of Dubuque had retired out of the Office of Fair Housing and they knew there was some history but they didn't know what it was. So we got no guidance at that point. Um, they said they'd get back to us. Uh, we asked and reached out a couple times. Finally, we're at a point uh, in December we said we absolutely just need to do this and they're not responding. So I sent a final email to the Office of Fair Housing and said, all you need to do is respond to this email and we will pause. Um, you know, it's just one of those things we, we can't wait forever for we'll get back to you. We started this in November of 21 asking for a response and we didn't get one. Um, I have, as of today, received no response from that email. So we are going to move forward but not uh, without a lot of data that we ran beforehand. Um, so we got a new software and we're able to actually collect our data uh, about race and demographics easily. We can run reports out of it and that started in April of 2022. So from April of 2022 until now, we ran each monthly wait list as if it had a preference point, it did not at the time, to see if there'd be a disparate impact on any of our protected classes at th three different places. If pre-application, wait list, and success for Lisa and we did not see any disparate impact. So we do have data that we ran to see if this would cause issues. As of today, we do not think that's gonna be a problem. However, we do need to keep track of that. So I have put the language specifically up here on purpose. I rarely do this on a PowerPoint presentation, but I don't want you to miss that we do have in here that exactly how you get a res residency preference. It's if you live in the city of Dubuque as jurisdiction defined by HUD, which is the city limits, and or if you have a job in the city of Dubuque. So you can be a resident, resident if you have a job or a job offer as well. So those are the, the ways that you can actually get a residency preference point. And then we go on to talk about directly in the admin plan that we must adhere to the Civil Rights Act and there are ways that we could cause a issue with this policy. So if we do, by one and a half percent standard deviation, it's a whole big calculation, comes down from the judicial branch, or greater is realized we're going to stop the preference point immediately. So we do not need to come back to council, we do not have to change the admin plan. It can be done immediately until we can consult with HUD. So we're putting this protection in place immediately so that there is no reason to have to come back. It's when the data hits it, we're gonna just wait until HUD comes back and says something to us. Um, sorry, I want to uh, quick go back because the, the one um, thing that we're, or the three things we're going to keep data on, 
I did talk about it a little bit, but the demographics of the pre-applicants, so when you apply, everybody that applies. We're keeping all the demographics, um, and if they got a residency point or not, and then also the demographics of those that win that lottery and get put on our wait list, and then the demographics of those successfully leasing in our jurisdiction. And we're gonna keep track of those three points because if you deviate from any of them, it could indicate that this policy caused that deviation. It may not, and it may not be the outcome, but it means it could, so we're gonna just stop. So those are the three things we're gonna keep track of. Other things that are big in the admin plan that we're gonna change, um, a lot of this is just because laws have changed, but our briefings can be done online. Um, anyone can do it in person if they request, but we are doing all of our briefings online now. And um, the violent drug, violent crime and drug related activity um, changed just because HUD changed their guidance. Um, you cannot have timelines for when crimes were committed. You have to look at each individual's situation um, and all of the documentation. You also cannot use arrest records. Um, which we were not using in the past, but we just wanted to make sure our language was updated, that we will not be doing those things for terminations. We also added our chapter 19. These are for special purpose vouchers. Um, these are for our FUP program, our VASH program, the veterans. So we've applied for these over the last couple years and gotten awarded these special purpose vouchers, so we needed to know how to administer them. So we added this chapter. Uh, mainstream vouchers are non-elderly disabled vouchers, um, so those are the four it covers. There is one more it covers that we're not using, um, but we still have it in the admin plan in case we happen to get awarded um, foster youth to independence, but we do not have any of those vouchers correct currently. And that is how all we are updating the admin plan. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Mayor, thank you very much. Every time you say residency preference, I get triggered. I, re I know what that is and what Mr. Jones and I went, you know, to all these trainings with our legal staff and Corey was there. And so I want to know, what do we have in writing? Because if it's not in writing, we could be burned again. Mm -hmm. A very public burning, don't they ever learn mm -hmm. kind of thing. So what do we have in writing? Sure. So in writing from HUD specifically, is that what we're... Who's ever, is? who could ever put the hammer down... What, from that agency? Sure. Um, we have no response from HUD. So there is nothing from HUD saying we will not review this. So that is on the table, that HUD has not come back and said, yes, you may. Now, HUD doesn't always come back and say, yes, you may. Um, they have been provided this admin plan, and they have not come back with any comments either. So we have uh, nothing in writing for any response. Uh, okay, and on, so one what, second, Mr. Resnick. Krenna, you, you want to jump in there. May I add something? Um, what we do have is when they did the letter of findings and then the VCA follow-up, and when we negotiated that agreement, they gave us a bit of a lay of the land, if you will, explaining um, how we could have done it better or um, differently in a way that they didn't feel would have been a problem and that specifically involved all of the math that I'm very grateful we have Alexis for um, because the standard deviations, the data tracking and things like that were very important to them. So they said that if we had had um, <clears throat> data up front and then we had had some periodic review of that for monitoring, um, if we could have caught it and then adjusted it, it would have been less of an issue for them. So some of that is built into exactly what Alexis is recommending. So, okay. Um, so why don't we make a, an appointment with them and go and talk to these people face to face and get on a, a plane and, and go there? Because if we don't have it in writing, there's no protection from, I mean, they can, they, they're very quick sometimes to point out the little things that, you know, are you kidding me? You have a residency uh, preference again? Mm -hmm. I mean, why, why can't we do that? I mean, this is a big deal, as you know, and you're doing so much work to solve this problem, but I don't see how we can move forward without um, something in writing from the highest authority at HUD. So we did, I mean, that's what we requested, and HUD is working from home. 
So they don't have an office that we can just show up at because there will be no one there at the Office of Fair Housing. Um, now, K uh, Kitty is her name, Kitty Amara at the Office of Fair Housing is the one who, when we were requesting the meeting, set up the phone call because that's all they're able to support and it was from her home. Um, can we go to her home? Uh, that would be great, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm only half kidding. I mean, that's a, a million dollars is a big deal, but I don't see how we can move forward without approval, direct, specific approval. Mm -hmm. I, I feel the same way when I hear residency preference and all of the other things. And um, the one um, thing is that HUD's unpredictable. It's unfortunate and they won't respond. So there's only so much we can do. And we can either not spend the money because we don't have another way to lease up faster um, or I mean, I, that's what's going to happen. And HUD doesn't care either way. They're going to give that money to another jurisdiction to use. So it's up to us to make the decision if we're willing to have our budget continue to decrease or we find solutions. Thank you very much. And Krenna, you're 100% sure this is a good idea? I'm, I will never say 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 90%? I, I think based on the information we have, we're following the best guidance available to us at this point based on our historical experience with HUD. You know, I actually like to suggest exactly what Mr. Resnick is suggesting here. And I think we should do a both and. I mean, I, I would like to vote for this to move forward because I think you've set it up in a way that's extremely rational. But I know, I mean, I'm taking two trips to Washington, D.C. personally in March. And I know that the rest of the council is going to be there as well at a different point in March. Um, I think Ms. Farber is going to be there with me at a, another part in March. So we have multiple opportunities. I would like to reach out to HUD and say, we would like to have a meeting with you, 30 minutes if, if that's all that's needed, to ask you a very specific question. Mm -hmm. And the mayor or city council members or the mayor and city council members are going to be there. Can we please have this meeting? Is that a possibility that we could do that? I think it seems important enough to avoid seven years of another Another one of these, I, I'm sorry, the name is escaping me, it's too late at night. Voluntary, voluntary compliance agreement. Voluntary compliance agreement that it was, it was really intense for us. And you know what, we got some benefit out of it, right? I mean, we learned some things, we taught ourselves something, it was really good. Um, but it was intense and we want to avoid that again and we want to do it for the right reasons. Um, so I would like to suggest that if that's a possibility at all, that, and hopefully be able to meet, I mean, Coffee shops are nice to have meetings. If offices don't exist, that's fine. Sure. But I think this is really important because it does scare me. I'm, I'm the same. It scares me to think about this and know that we could get slapped again for just trying to do the right thing by our, our residents who need housing. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess that's a question. Yeah, I, it, it's possible. Now, the D.C. office is not who actually runs and did not do our audit and doesn't actually help us. Um, we, where do we get to go? But Kansas City. Well, that's not, <laughs> so that's not our, our district office, uh, our regional office, they call it, is in Kansas City. Um, and so they are who run all of that. So Natasha is the director of that region, and she would run all that. If we had an audit, they'd be coming from that office. Here, we'll try and set it up. I'm serious about this. I, I think it's important enough to be able to make a trip to do that. I, I really do. I, we've definitely been trying to set it up. I mean, this wasn't a on a whim. I mean, we had good relationships with them, they're still not answering our phone calls. Yeah. Um, it was nice that they answered the TH's phone call, so maybe we can finally get them to answer. Yeah. And you know, I, and I- Set I us really, up, John. <laughs> <laughs> We're still here at the meeting with us. I, I really do want to, I, I want to make it really, really clear. You know, I, I don't think our intention in this conversation is to disparage the, the housing and urban development program or the, um, uh, any office that they're in. But, um, but we really do need communication on this particular item. This is really, really important for us, so, okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. Do you think that the best court of, of item would be to table this or to get other opinions before we make a motion? I guess I have a question then. Is there a way to, to approve it but move forward cautiously with the practice of it? it, it or is it, if we approve it, does it go to HUD and it's like in stone? It's in stone once you prove it to HUD, you could then modify it. Um, I would recommend that if you wanted to strike the section for residency preference, 
that we approve everything else because we have to have the laws that are that are in the rest of the plan for the Violence Against Women Act, et cetera. So sure. I need you to approve the plan tonight, but if you want to strike the residency preference, you can do that really easily because it's a full section and it can just go away. If we do so though, can you implement that this year at all? Or is yes. this your only shot? No, do? I can bring it back to the council with that residency preference whenever we feel comfortable doing so. Oh, okay, so it, we, can, we can do that. Yes. And you can still move forward, and then we can make sure we get an answer and then go. Yes, and the reason we brought it forward now is because we have one calendar year to spend the budget, and then we lose the budget forever. It's just gone. So that's when we do lease-ups. It takes about 90 days to lease-up vouchers. So as we start getting success rate at 25%, it's going, we're just, we're gonna continue to drop and then we're not gonna be able to make it up if we just start implementing in July. And that's why we bought it early. It doesn't mean you can't do it, well, so. But that's what makes, okay, and I'll shut up and let you guys talk for it, but that's what makes me nervous. I mean, I want you to be able to do the job you need to do and get people housing. And if we, if we strike this, then we, you just can't use that tool in your toolbox at all. For now. Ms. Farber. Quick question, could you define lease up Sure, when someone actually signs a lease with a landlord uh, with a housing choice voucher. So that's what we considered leased up, that you're in a unit. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm one sorry. of the advantages of doing it this way, and I'm, I apologize if you already has made this clear, is when we have people who don't yet have a place to live and they're looking for a place with a voucher and can't find one, but we have a lot of low income people who already have a place to live and don't have a voucher. And so if we can give the local preference, somebody who already has an apartment, but really can't afford it, can qualify for the voucher, assuming their landlord will accept it. And that will make it so we can spend this money and get it, help the people who need help not being able to afford where they live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sprank. Um, okay, so we do this. Well, this has theoretically been approved. What happens if you still don't get the people to do it and we then lose the money? What, what are the effects then? Like what are the, what's the ripple effect? If the landlord, landlord still won't accept yes. for people who are in place. Yes. Um, it, it, we still don't get to spend the money. So we are, uh, there is unfortunately that still on the table is we need landlords to accept the voucher. But doesn't HUD set some type of guidelines as to like, oh, you're supposed to have these many units and people on it, and if we don't qualify, do we get into more trouble with, with the feds on these things? Or um, That was one of the voluntary compliance agreement uh, letter of findings was that our program was decreasing their number of vouchers, and we're not trying, but that's what's happening. And so that decrease can also cause the effect of disparate impacts based on policies, but we don't, like, we're, we're trying to find ways to remove those barriers because it's not exactly our policies, but they also quoted community um, biases and, and acts, you know, throughout the community, not just our own. So it's a kind of a complicated issue. Two more questions. Yeah. Sorry. I know it's late. Okay. So one time you mentioned, I believe, the roses. Those are vouchers that are that are located with the facility that can't move. Mm -hmm. Can we still do more of those? Yeah, and we've attempted to do more of those um, in certain developments that are coming online okay. um, to get awarded, like National Housing Trust funds. Uh, none of them got awarded this last year, so they weren't able to use those. Um, so yes, we have tried to do some more of those. You can use up to 20% of your vouchers in a project-based fashion. Policy idea here. We have a lot of properties we know we need to rehab. What if we made it something like a, I don't know, this is a hypothetical policy of like, okay, we're giving you money to redo your policy on a state level, on, from the city level. You have to have more than what we believe, like I know TIF, when we do TIF stuff that we have a certain arrangement but we also have a lot of older properties that are gonna to need to be, well, we don't, but the city has a lot of older properties that need to be rehabbed sooner or later. We could, is that a possibility or even a legal, legal possibility to make that part of the agreement with folks that they have to take 15% instead of 10%? Of project-based vouchers? Yes. yes. It's always a possibility, yes. And we could even lock it in with the properties. So we would always know that there's a certain number of properties 
for a little while at least. And we could even make it so five years, is that an option, a window, or does it have to be forever with the property? So with the project-based vouchers, your initial contract has to be 20 years. And so that a lot of developers shy away from something that long because they intend to likely sell within the 20 years or change managing agents or whatever that happens. I mean, 20 years is a very long time for an initial contract. That's one barrier to the project-based vouchers. Okay. I think you also have to take into consideration we can't get landlords who own the properties today to accept them. How are we going to get somebody to invest hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in a building on our condition of our assistance is you have to do this project-based voucher thing now. I mean, I, I think it would be a policy that would never get acted on. We do make them agree to accept housing choice vouchers as rent, because of course by state law we can't mandate that by ordinance. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I, I feel David's pain on this one, and I, I didn't really particularly enjoy the VCA that we lived through. However, it made us a better city because each and every one of us learned a great deal about uh, um, disparate impact on, in all kinds of circumstances, and I'm, I'm grateful for that portion of it. Um, I think this is the right thing to do. I think that your unanswered email trail would give uh, a finder of fact pause to find that you did something with any kind of uh, malintent. Um, I, I think Crenn is comfortable with that as well from her comments. And I think maybe it's time to follow John Lewis's lead and get in some good trouble if that's what it takes. I agree. I think we should move it forward. Any other comments? All right, well, the motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution in front of us um, as is. So motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? No. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes six to one. Action item number 12 is delivering Dubuque Fire Department video. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file. Apologize to Amy and do the video. <laughs> but look at all the stuff you know that you didn't know oh, this man. afternoon. Uh, second. The official motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Um, Chief Scheller, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're about to see that you are the star of the show, so thank you very much. You can roll that video, please. Medical, fire, or natural disaster. When an emergency arises, our community counts on our fire and medical staff to be there for us. And that requires training, proper equipment, and public investment. On this episode of Delivering Dubuque, we look at Dubuque Fire's response and the steps they take to protect our lives and property. years, fire departments have changed and evolved, adapting to the needs of the community, and that's definitely been true in the city of Dubuque. So here to discuss that with us today and the growth and change here in our fire department is Fire Chief Amy Scheller. So Chief, thank you very much for coming today. Oh, thanks a lot, Mayor. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, I, you know, the first thing I want to ask about is just some of those changes, some of the ways that fire departments have evolved over the years, you know, in your experience that you've had and, and what you see here in Dubuque. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's definitely been a career that's been exciting started out just as a fire department, right? Providing fire service, and it's evolved since then. It has been nonstop. So we've added hazardous material, technical rescue, community risk reduction, analyzing data, and then applying our resources appropriately for the community. But really, I think the one thing that's taken off a lot is EMS. There's a misalignment, I think, with the understanding of the fire department. A lot of times you see a fire engine or a ladder truck, and you assume it's just firefighters that are there to work on a fire incident. Well, in fact, it could be firefighter paramedics working an EMS incident. So statistically, about 7,800 calls we handle in the city of Dubuque. 
and about 80% of those are EMS calls. So to have our fire vehicles equipped with the ALS equipment, uh, the training and the personnel is really critical. What does it really take for a firefighter these days? I mean, you know, to be qualified to be a firefighter and a paramedic here in the city of Dubuque. Yeah, that's a great question because it's changed just a little bit. So as a fire department member, previously you required to be paramedic. And it's really important to understand the levels of paramedicine. There's a basic level and that's EMTB. And then there's an EMT advanced level. And then there's a paramedic level. The paramedic level takes about a year to get through. It involves uh, pharmacology, drugs, the effect of the body on medications, cardiology, advanced airway. A lot of the things that you can see in an emergency room, these paramedics that are arriving at your house and your business are able to do a lot of those advanced skills. So for testing in the city of Dubuque, we have made one change. We were given approval to uh, test for EMT level and absorb certain numbers of EMTs into our department and support them as they go through paramedicine. And we saw really no big change in our numbers. We were around 17 people last test and we we're about the same number here. It's not a hidden secret that there are challenges with recruitment. Huge drops in the numbers, and we're seeing that nationally across fire departments. We talk about uh, challenges all the time. Is it our communication on what the profession is about? There's so much more to be a public servant and to serve the community is such a rewarding career. It has been for me, and I know many of the individuals that I work with. That's a vein, so we can put a tube in. And so getting that aspect out there, understanding that there's a flexible schedule. It's a 24 on, 24 off. It's different. It's not a Monday through Friday. When you're on the operation side, there's opportunities for advancement, for specialization. You could be a hazardous material technician, you could be a fire investigator, and there are opportunities to retire at the end of a career with a pension. You know, you mentioned something that I think weighs heavily on me as mayor, and I know it does in city council and the folks here too, is just the, the challenges in recruiting. You know, the, the challenges in getting people into these jobs that really are very good careers. There are so many different opportunities in the profession itself and, and really just in the city of Dubuque to be able to, to work in a really great place in a great community. When we think about, um, you know, the size of the force and the ability to recruit is we want to make sure that we respond in uh, the fastest time that we possibly can. But our response times are pretty good from what I understand. So I'm, I'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to understand what elements make up a response time too. Fire departments across the nation evaluate response time from three specific components. One is call handling. And then there's a turnout time component, which is the time the fire department gets notified. And when they get their gear on or get their gear and the equipment and start rolling toward that incident. The final is the travel component. Uh, and that's a big piece, right? Where stations are located, how we can access uh, residents in the community. Those components we strive for about a six minute, 90% of the time, right? So a lot of times people talk in averages, we don't talk in averages, we talk in like almost perfection. So when you see six minutes or six minutes, 10 seconds, that's at a 90% uh, expectation. We're performing about eight minutes and eight seconds, so there's opportunities for improvement. We see opportunities on the call handling side, a little bit of opportunities on the uh, turnout side, but really travel, that's where it comes into station locations and where you put your fleet and where you put your resources. A city as old as Dubuque, we've had fire stations that have been there for a very long time, and you think about how it grows outward, you kind of have to grow and change with it. As the city council sets goals and priorities, the last two years, one of our top priorities has been locations of fire stations to figure out what is going to be most efficient and effective. So we're in the middle of that. We're gaining some confidence in some of the data that we're seeing, but they're plotting out different scenarios, which include keeping main headquarters where it is and looking at different locations for all the remaining stations. It includes keeping main headquarters in, in an additional station and then two stations, three stations. I think we're primed here, but it's gonna take a little bit of a commitment from the community in recognizing that and we're gonna need a lot of support. It's great to hear that we have a fire department that is moving in that direction, using real data to be able to make those decisions. So that's yeah, great. Absolutely. And this takes real investment for a community to have a fire department that's going to perform at the highest level and, and do the things that we ask of a fire department. A little over 41% of our general fund in the city of Dubuque goes toward paying for public safety. So fire department, police department, 911 services, things like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of that investment that a city makes in that kind of a situation? Yeah, absolutely. That's the critical piece. We have seen some really challenging budgetary changes, and I can speak just to vehicles and equipment alone. You know, the, the price of those is skyrocketing, and it's skyrocketing across the United States. 
United States. So we already talked about the stations and the commitment there, but even just some of the simple equipment, such as cardiac monitors, those are an investment, but it gives our people an opportunity to be advanced in some of the techniques that they're using. For example, we can defibrillate a patient, but our cardiac monitors will actually tell our first responders the depth and the rate of their compressions, which are most beneficial. That's realized in some of the numbers that we're seeing. We're saving about a person a month at this current year in 2022, and we plan on just increasing that number year after year after year. So that's impactful, but it takes an investment and it takes that understanding. It's not just putting a person on scene, it's putting them on scene well-equipped, well-trained, confident, uh, understanding the technology and the changes of fire and EMS uh, service providers. And we're really looking forward to the future. I can tell you in the six months that I've been here, I am really excited. I'm really excited about the personnel that I'm working with, and I'm really excited about the commitment from the community. So we've covered a lot here today. I mean, talking about a lot of, uh, you know, the skills that it takes to be a firefighter, how great of an opportunity it really is, um, how we're looking for good firefighters, we're looking for those opportunities, but then also just the importance of this in our community as a, as a basic function, a basic public safety um, organization that a city has to have, the importance of that investment. Well, I know I'm thankful to have you as our chief and have your department here uh, to take care of us every single day. So thank you so much for being here and telling us more about it, Chief. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it, Mayor. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well done, Chief. And thank you for hanging out with us for so long tonight. We really do appreciate your patience. Okay. Motion is to receive and file and watch that. Uh, Aiden, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. 7-0. Next are council member reports. Ms. Farber? Yes, I had the privilege on February 1st um, to attend uh, the World Read Aloud Day at Washington Junior High. And I wanted to give a shout out to um, Katie Hannon, who is the librarian at Washington, and to thank her for organizing such a fun morning uh, for those of us that were readers. And I actually got to sit down literally on the floor with sixth graders, and I read a really fun book called Shea Bob, which was about an alligator opening up a restaurant. So it was very, I thought, relevant for me to be doing that in terms of the background. Um, but what a great, great opportunity. It was a lot of fun. And the message, of course, was if we can read to the kids, they can read to their parents or they can read to their friends. So it was really just a reach out day. Um, focusing on books, and it was just a pleasure. So it was fun, and again, I wanted just a shout out to uh, Katie and to Washington for sponsoring that. Thank, Thank you. you. Nothing else I'm seeing this evening, so we do have a closed session. All right, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move the City Council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending real estate sales. Second by Wethel. Jones, second by Wethel. For the record, the attorney the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in the closed <coughs> session is city attorney Crenna Brumwell. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We're on closed session.